Okay, the live has started. Sergeant, would you start okay, your recordings? DC recording is on the way. The light is on. Yeah. The live stream has been recorded. I'm sorry. Thank you. The cloud has started. Backup is rolling. And Sergeant Martinez, will you do the opening statement? Good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Transportation. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. And if you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at the following email address. Testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. We are ready to begin. Hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you to the sergeants and all the technicians and everyone behind uh, the tech and, and the Zoom to be sure that all New Yorkers have the opportunity from we, the council member, the administration and members of the public to join this hearing that we are holding today. Thank you for joining today's hearing of the Committee of Transportation regarding intro 2224. Before I give my opening statement, I'm going to turn it over to our committee council and moderator to go over some procedure items. Thank you, Chair. I'm Elliot Lynn, counsel to the Transportation Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you'll be unmuted by the host. Please listen for your name to be called. I will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. Our first panelist will be from the administration. From the DOT, First Deputy Commissioner, Mar Margaret Forgioni, Senior Director of Research, Implementation and Safety, Anne Marie Doherty, Director of Strategic Initiatives, Julie Kite Laidlaw, and Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs, Rebecca Zack. And then from the NYPD, we have Chief of Transportation, Kim Royster, Deputy Chief Michael Pilecki, Lieutenant Jack Deep Singh, and Assistant Deputy Commissioner for Legal Matters, Oleg Chernyavsky. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and the chair or I will call on you in order. Unless otherwise indicated by the chair, we will be limiting council member questions to five minutes. Please also note that for ease of this virtual hearing, we will not be allowing a second round of questioning. Thank you. Chair Rodriguez. Thank you, Elliot, and all the staff. And again, from the central office of the council to the staff in my office for helping out to work on this bill and to put this hearing together. It, first, today the committee uh, convened a remotely to hold a hearing on intro 2224 a local law that I have a sponsor along with Council Member Lander, Speaker Johnson, Council Member Levin, to amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to, establish, to the establishment of a cross investigation and analysis unit within the Department of Transportation. Before I get deep into this, let's call things as it is. The number of women in the Coalition Investigation Unit is not enough to investigate all those crashes that we have in the city of New York. For many years, I've been calling to double that number so that among those 44,000 of crashes that we have, we should have enough men and women power to investigate it. We will hear testimony today about so many cases that this unit doesn't have the resources or the power to go deep and get to the conclusion of those cases. 
So regardless of the outcome of this hearing, regardless on how we will change this unit, reality is, and that's what I'm calling today, that the numbers of men and women in this unit must be doubled in order to respond to all those crises that have made the, this situation a crisis in New York City. This bill is part of the council's legislative package aimed at reforming the New York City Police Department. The entire legislative package was introduced in response to the, to the, govern, to the governor directive for the city to adopt a policy reform plan by April 1st of this year. Every year in the city, there are many motor vehicle crashes that cause fatalities or serious injuries. According to the statistic from the Vision Zero View that board, there were 244 traffic fatalities and 43,866 traffic injuries in 2020. That number is too much. Whenever there is a serious or fatal crash in the city, the NYPD's Coalition Investigation Squad, or CIS, which is currently housed in the highway district, respond in order to investigate the details of the crash and determine how and why it occurred. The unit is staffed with NYPD officers that are trained in collision uh, forensics. However, over the last several year, question, years, questions have been raised about the unit's effectiveness investigating these major crashes, which have led many transportation and public safety advocates to call for his responsibility to be transferred out of the NYPD. Intro 2224 will establish a crash investigation and analysis units within the DOT. This new unit would be tasked with investigating all vehicle crashes involving significant injuries in coordination with the police departments. Again, in coordination with the police department. It would also be required to make recommendations for safety improving changes to a street design and infrastructure and to post his report on the DOT website. I believe that DOT is more than capable of taking on the responsibility for investigating serious vehicle crashes by establishing a crash investigation and analysis units within the DOT. We can make the changes that are needed to help decrease the number of serious or fatal crashes across our city. I agree that at some level, the NYPD must be included within the investigation. And this is part of an ongoing conversation we will have at the council. However, the issue at hand is how can we effectively and efficiently review and investigate the hundreds of vehicle crashes that are yet to be resolved. The transportation committee and the advocate will continue to be committed to improving the safety of our roads. I strongly believe that CIS is in coordination within the Department of Transportation will become a more effective tool in decreasing the number of yearly crashes we see across the five boroughs. Before we hear from the Department of Transportation, I will have our moderator, our moderator to recognize the committee members that are in attendance with us today and to administer the oath to the officials that are here to testify. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we have been joined by Council Members Cabrera, Deutsch, Diaz, Holden, Ku, Levine, Miller, and Yeager. Um, I will now call on the following panelists to testify. Margaret Forgione, Anne-Marie Doherty, Julie Kite Laidlaw, Rebecca Zach, Kim Royster, Michael Pilecki, Jagdeep Singh, and Oleg Chernyovsky. I will read the affirmation and then call on each individual to confirm their response aloud for the record. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee, 
and to respond honestly to council member questions. Deputy Commissioner Forgione. Yes. Anne Marie Doherty. You're muted. Yes. Uh, Julia Kite Laidlaw. Yes. Rebecca Zach. Yes. Chief Royster. Yes. Michael Pilecki. Yes. Jagdeep Singh. Yes. Oleg Chernyovsky. Yes. Thank you. You may begin your testimony when ready. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. I am Margaret Forgione, First Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Transportation. I am joined by Judy Kite Laidlaw, Director of Strategic Initiatives, Anne Marie Doherty, Senior Director of Research, Implementation, and Safety, and Rebecca Zach, Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs. We are here before you on behalf of our new Commissioner, Hank Gutman. We are also joined by Chief Royster and Assistant Deputy Commissioner Chernovsky of the NYPD. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today on behalf of Mayor de Blasio. I will start by walking you through DOT's process for responding to traffic fatalities and our data-driven approach for prioritizing safety enhancements citywide. When there is a serious traffic crash, NYPD's local precinct arrives first and secures the crash site. NYPD's collision investigation squad is then called to investigate crashes that result in fatalities, likely to die, or critical injuries about 350 crashes per year. CIS officers inspect and collect evidence, interview witnesses and suspects, examine vehicle mechanisms, perform field sobriety testing, and apprehend or arrest suspects. DOT emergency response also responds to the CIS investigated crashes, either when they are still active crash investigation scenes or the next morning if the crash occurred overnight. At the site, DOT's emergency responder obtains information about the crash, photographs the area, and assesses whether any signs, markings, signals, or street conditions are defective. The responder submits a report to DOT's communication center, which then notifies the appropriate DOT unit if repairs are needed. DOT investigates every fatal crash site for possible safety enhancements. We evaluate the CIS report and visit the site a second time to observe traffic behavior and other field conditions. We also look at crash history and trends through a much larger crash database, including data collected by PD's entire patrol force, over 60,000 injuries per year, and data from New York State DOT to determine whether safety where safety enhancements are most urgently needed. This data analysis informs nearly all of the agency's work in Vision Zero policy. Through our Vision Zero Borough Pedestrian Safety Action Plans, we use fatality from NYPD and severe injury data from State DOT to identify Vision Zero priority geographies, corridors, intersections, and areas that disproportionately account for pedestrian fatalities and severe injuries, and prioritize them for safety interventions. For example, in our 2015 Manhattan Plan, we identified Upper Broadway as a priority corridor with five priority intersections between 155th and 170th streets. This analysis informed our 2017 Street Improvement Project in which we installed pedestrian islands, implemented signal timing changes and more to shorten crossing distances and reduce turning conflicts. Our data analysis also helps us understand crash patterns and trends to inform new safety treatments. Our left turn crash study looked at locations with high numbers of pedestrian and cyclist injuries from left turning vehicles and identified the types of intersections and streets where these crashes could happen. This results in the development of a new treatment, left turn traffic calming. We implemented this treatment along with a 10 second leading pedestrian interval to give pedestrians a head start at multiple intersections along Northern Boulevard in Queens, a high crash corridor with high pedestrian and traffic volumes. We also implemented this treatment at many intersections citywide that data indicates could benefit from the safety enhancement. Many of our programs are also designed and implemented based on crash data. We use this data to develop our annual street improvement projects, which are comprehensive street redesign projects at high crash intersections or corridors. Our proactive warrant analysis program uses fatality, injury and crash data to identify locations for inclusion in signal studies, rather than relying solely on requests from the public. Our speed cameras are installed in locations based on a mix of speed and crash data. 
Finally, we develop education and strategic communications campaigns and work with NYPD to target enforcement based on crash data. For example, the city's dusk and darkness safety initiative emerged from DOT's analysis of serious injury and fatality crashes, which revealed a pattern of increased danger relating to earlier sunsets in the winter months. For five years in a row, we have worked with NYPD on education and enforcement campaigns during these months. Now turning to intro 2224, sponsored by Chair Rodriguez, Speaker Johnson, Councilmember Lander, and Councilmember Levin. This bill would require DOT to create a new crash investigation and analysis unit, which would have the primary responsibility for investigating, analyzing, and reporting on all serious vehicular crashes. The unit would be required to review the street design at each serious crash location and any available crash data for locations with similar street design or infrastructure citywide. The unit would also need to determine whether changes to street design or improvements to infrastructure could reduce the risk of subsequent serious vehicular crashes and make recommendations for changes at the crash location or citywide. We oppose this bill for several reasons. First, as I've just described, DOT has a robust system in place for evaluating traffic fatalities and analyzing crash data to enhance safety citywide, which includes developing broadly applied design interventions based on lessons we learned from analyzing crash site characteristics, as the bill would require. This is at the heart of our agency's work and core to our mission. It is critical that DOT retain the discretion to prioritize such enhancements where they would have the greatest safety benefit and to determine which locations to study and change. Not every traffic fatality can be prevented with street redesign or new infrastructure, and not all interventions and locations yield the same results. This legislative mandate would hamper our proven effectiveness and second guess our professional expertise. Second, the role that the bill seeks to transfer to DOT is a law enforcement function that must continue to be performed by law enforcement personnel. NYPD's CIS officers are experts in criminal collision investigations and are on call 24 seven to respond immediately to crash scenes to collect and preserve evidence. As you will hear from my NYPD colleagues, these officers typically need at least 10 years of police experience to be considered for the squad and receive numerous specialized training courses, including a multi-week course specific to vehicle collisions. This squad of experts is highly skilled and has significant experience collecting evidence interviewing witnesses and suspects, performing field sobriety tests, and providing testimony for the prosecutor's offices. Taking over primary responsibility for investigating crashes and potentially staffing the unit with law enforcement personnel with comparable experience and training would be a massive challenging undertaking for our agency that is outside of our expertise. DOT is committed to enhancing accountability and serious consequences for reckless driving, but this bill would have the opposite effect. Prosecutors rely heavily on CIS's investigative work. Shifting these investigations to DOT, an agency without specialized law enforcement expertise, at least for the first few years, could severely compromise the prosecutor's cases and lead to fewer convictions, effectively decriminalizing vehicular deaths and bringing fewer reckless drivers to justice. Third, given the city's current fiscal crisis, it is essential that DOT be able to focus our resources on meeting our key commitments. This bill would require the crash investigation and analysis unit to respond to nine times the number of crashes NYPD CIS currently investigates, requiring hundreds of new personnel, and would be a huge undertaking outside of our expertise at a time when the staffing of our essential operations is already strained. In conclusion, I would like to thank the council for the opportunity to testify today. DOT looks forward to working with you toward our shared goal of increasing safety and accountability on the city's streets. We would be happy to answer any questions after you hear from NYPD. Thank you, Commissioner. Good morning, Chair Rodriguez and members of the council. I am Chief Kim Royster, the New York City Police Department's Chief of Transportation. I am joined today by Assistant Deputy Commissioner of Legal Matters, Ola Charnakbarski. On behalf of Police Commissioner Dermot Shea, I would like to thank you for this opportunity to discuss the role of the NYPD's Collision Investigation Squad and the department's response to an investigation of serious traffic collisions. At the outset of my testimony, I want to discuss the work of the NYPD's Collision Investigation Squad. 
better known as CIS. This is the specialized unit tasked with investigating the city's most serious traffic collisions. CIS is called to major incidents where there is a critical injury as determined by on-scene EMS. There is a serious injury and the party is likely to die or a person dies as a result of the collision. CIS will also respond to collisions involving vehicles that have fled the scene after rendering any party involved in a critical condition. CIS can also be called to a scene by any executive member of the department if they determine the situation warrants it. In addition, CIS, the NYPD also deploys the Collision Technician Group, better known as CTG, who assists CIS detectives in examining evidence at the scene of a collision. CIS is currently comprised of a team of 22 detectives, five sergeants, and one lieutenant, while CTG currently has 13 police officers, one sergeant, and one lieutenant. These dedicated public servants are integral to improving public safety. In order to join CIS, members must typically first advance through the ranks of highway patrol, where they gain years of hands-on experience in processing collision scenes. Typically, members have at least 10 years of experience as a police officer, <coughs> must be selected to join the highway district, and must then have been assigned to CTG. Upon joining CTG, members receive the training necessarily to properly analyze, collect, and document the evidence found at collision scenes. They are trained in the use of sophisticated equipment, which enables them to accurately reconstruct a collision scene. Upon moving up to CIS, members are required to complete the 15-day criminal investigations course, where they learn about forensic DNA and trace evidence and how to manage a crime scene to collect and preserve evidence, the requirements of search warrants, interview techniques, and the laws concerning questioning suspects. These members must also complete the 10-day homicide investigation course, where they receive a comprehensive and intensive treatment of concepts and techniques in homicide investigations and training from the medical examiner. Moreover, they must also complete the five-day advanced roadside impairment course, and must be trained in standard field sobriety tests. On top of this, CIS investigators receive nine weeks of training specific to automobile collisions. In partnership with Northwestern University, these courses include basic crash investigation, crash reconstruction, vehicle dynamics, crash investigation with human factors, and injury biometrics. Members of CIS must be proficient in knowledge of algebra, trigonometry, mathematical order of operations, and physics to complete the curriculum. I believe that it would also be helpful to discuss what goes into collision investigation to provide members of the council with background information on the work we do and why the NYPD is the best agency to conduct these investigations. Collision investigations are at their core criminal investigations, which is within the basic functions of the NYPD and our officers in CIS and CTG, and are well positioned to conduct these investigations. Wherever CIS is requested to respond to the scene of a, of a collision, CTG members also respond. CTG is similar to the department's crime scene unit, which is responsible for processing the scene of serious crimes such as a homicide or a robbery for evidence. CTG members are the department's experts in not only collecting evidence at the scene of vehicle collisions, but are actually able to reconstruct the scene of serious collisions. Among their duties at the scene of serious collisions, CTG members take measurements of the entire crime scene, measure skid marks, collect physical evidence, including DNA where appropriate, take photographs and canvas the area for video evidence. CTG members are also 
required to examine the drivers involved for signs of impairment using the standard sobriety testing and portable breath testers. CIS investigators commence their investigation by utilizing information obtained by CTG. CIS members interview witnesses, question vehicle occupants, obtain subpoenas, execute search warrants, review evidence, and ensure that the vehicle's onboard computer is obtained for analysis. If the fact of the case warrant, an arrest will be effected at the scene. If not warranted, the CIS investigators will work closely with the borough district attorney as the investigation proceeds and the case is built. The district attorney will evaluate the case presented by the CIS investigators and make the ultimate determination <laughs> as to whether an arrest is warranted. The CIS investigators will confer with the Office of the Medical Examiner, testify in front of and panel grand juries, and consult with the Detective Bureau to establish, to establish criminal patterns. At times, individuals who are involved in deadly collisions have been found to be involved in other criminal activities. I would like to also highlight the infrastructure that the NYPD has in place that is critical to the proper investigation of any collision. First, the NYPD already has a team of drug recognition experts who have been trained in recognizing whether a person is under the influence of controlled substance. Their expertise is invaluable in determining criminality in a collision. Moreover, the NYPD has a long-standing and well-established property clerk's office which stores evidence. In order to prosecute a crime, the district attorney must establish the chain of custody of all evidence from the moment it is collected to the time it reaches the courtroom. Any small break in the chain of custody could result in evidence being inadmissible in court. Having robust evidence control procedures, which are already in place in the NYPD, is essential in prosecuting a criminal case. Moreover, automobiles are frequently evidence in such cases and secure storage facilities are essential to maintaining the chain of custody of the evidence vehicle itself. All of this work is essential to Vision Zero. As an interagency task force, each agency brings specific expertise to the table. This interagency partnership is critical to the success of the initiative and we at the NYPD are committed to bringing our wealth of investigative expertise to ensure the safety of our streets. Since I have taken over the Chief of Transportation, I have asked CIS with, I have tasked CIS with providing outreach to the families and individuals involved in serious collisions. Our officers are trained to engage with families in a professional and courteous manner. Each family is provided with a resource guide at their initial consult with the CIS investigator, which are tailored to each individual case. I believe that communication with family members is essential, and I will ensure that we will continually improve this process. I wanna take this opportunity to highlight how we are fortunate in the NYPD and have such a committed partnership with the Department of Transportation. DOT plays a critical role in these investigations by responding to the collision scene and using their design and engineering expertise to determine if there may have been any underlying causes of the collision. Other than our side-by-side -side work in the field, the NYPD and DOT attend weekly traffic safety forums where precincts and DOT borough teams are able to share information and promote continuous conversation to improve traffic safety. Additionally, we have a monthly DOT and NYPD interagency meeting. I would now like to turn my attention to the legislation being considered today. Introduction 2224 would transfer the investigative authority of certain collisions from the NYPD to the Department of Transportation. The department is committed to a partnership with DOT 
and making the city's streets safe for all New Yorkers. However, criminal investigations are the core functions of the police force. Our CIS investigators are experts in collision investigation and have years of experience and training. Requiring DOT to perform these tasks without specialized personnel, training, facilities, and system in, systems in place will create significant gaps that will not only undermine the success of collision investigations, but will also be, will not be beneficial to victims and those collisions and their supervisors, uh, survivors. Finally, the reporting requirements of this proposal are overly broad and raise serious privacy and investigative concerns. I would mandate, it would mandate the publication of all evidence, even photographs depicting deceased individuals that should not be made public and would compromise confidentiality of criminal investigations. In closing, the department takes very seriously its responsibility for providing safe streets for motorists, pedestrians, passengers, and cyclists. However, we must oppose this leg legislation for the reasons we have discussed, as it would inappropriately transfer a core law enforcement role from the agency best suited to perform it. Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today, and I am pleased to answer your questions. Thank you. Again, I want to acknowledge that we've also been joined by council members Minchaka, Levin, and Lander. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. And for me, it has been also an honor to be working with you, as also I work with Chief Morris uh, and also uh, Chief Chan. And, 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 and one thing that I want to be clear is that we know that in 2021, uh, all of us want to take our city back to our feet and be feet and be able to, you know, uh, not only to get rid of the COVID-19, but also to address on everything that we had to do to continue providing the necessary resources that all department need, including the NYPD, to keep our city safe at the same time that we address some challenges. And in the case, as you know, the NYPD, we I always say that, you know, I'm all about a, a continue working on a, getting more men and women from the NYPD to be in the street a, fighting crimes. And that's why a, I think that 21 would be a critical year that we had to identify different area that we have men and women of the NYPD that instead of being in some unit, they should or, or in, in doing some job in the present that can be done by civilians. It, 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 to have those individuals, again, fighting crimes and, and be able to, for us to continue supporting all of you guys at the NYPD at the same time, of course, that we continue, continue doing everything that we have to do to improve the relationship between the police and the community. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, my first one is, how many crashes happened in 2020? And how many ended with people being in critical conditions? So as you mentioned, um, 2020 was a, uh, a very trying year for us, uh, nationally as well as here in the NYPD. And when you uh, start to look at how- Chief, it I'm sorry, for, I'm sorry. Can you just give me the number? Can you tell me how many crashes happened in 20 last year? So in 2020, there were 111 crash, 111,000 crashes in 2020. How many, how many ended with people being in critical conditions? And how many died? Um, 374 total CIS. In critical conditions? Yes. And how many died? 245. Can you, can you look and then compare similar numbers in 2019? Yes. 
So in 2019, the total number of crashes were 210,000. And the total serious was 349. And the total fatalities was 220. So when we look in 2019, then based on those numbers, we have double, almost double number in 2019. You say 20, 210,000 in 2019 and 111,000 in, in last year in 2020? That's correct. But the number on, on a base, again, on information that we have shared with you guys as a department was that <clears throat> the number in, in the previous year of people ending in critical condition was around 4,000. So, so the, 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 when you look at the number of injuries, that number would be larger than the number of injuries that were critical. But again, the number that have been shared in previous hearing on, on it, it with you guys, and, 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 and I don't know how we ended with that number because on the previous year, the number has been being around 44,000 crashes. And from those 44,000, there were 4,000 people in critical condition and an average of one person dying every week. So I don't know if you can look back to those numbers or you're very strong that those numbers again that the team have been shared with you are accurate or, or if we had to you know, look on deeply to those numbers. I think so Chair, I'm oh, sorry. I, I was just going to jump in. So everything um, that the chief said, um, we agree with, but I think you know what you're getting at is that obviously um, every potential CIS is looked at, which is in the neighborhood of 300, is, is the site is visited actively as, the, as it occurs, um, which is about 350 a year. But according to the bill, if we were going to include, then include everything categorized as serious, um, our records show that would entail about 3,600 per year. Commissioner, those are the numbers that I share with you. If you look back to the testimony of the previous DOT commissioner, the number of crashes was around 44,000 a year, and the numbers of people in critical condition were around 4,000, right. and the number of people dying were one person per week in average. Yes. yes. Okay, so can we look back to the chief and, and the unit and say, uh, so what are the numbers of people then in critical, that end in critical condition, so that we can be accurate with the number? in 2019 and in 2020. Right. I mean, I think council member, I think what we're, what the chief is giving you is the total number of jobs that CIS responded to. Which are, and the triggers for CIS response are critical injuries, uh, deaths, um, critical injuries likely to die. Um, yeah. So, My guy, and, and then there's there's an ability for for CIS to be called to the scene outside. Of the, the number, the number, the number that that number again, as you know, has come for you guys. The number of crashes. In New York City in the previous year, have never been saying that in 2019 we had 210,000. This is about before COVID, the number was share with us coming from you guys 44,000. And the same numbers of people in critical condition around 4,000. And the people dying every week, average of one per week. Those were your number before. So if I could just add some clarity um, for, for, 20, for 2019, 
there were 60,930 injuries. And for 2020 was 44,030 injuries. So how many of the 69,000 ended with people being in critical conditions? So I wouldn't have that data set broken out because, because the data set would be critical, serious injury likely to die, critical or death. Okay, so if we, if we can go back, you know, if, we, if you can look at the number, I'm interested for us to share that information and we end in the best place as possible. And I know that this is gonna be teamwork. Whatever way we gonna be ending, making any change, any reform, my interest in my business to be sure that, you know, we go deep on this number, but I want for all to you guys, if you can look back and see, you know, like those 4,000 that sharing from you guys uh, from the NYPD in the previous hearing, uh, what is the number like? Because that's an important number. The numbers of people in critical condition as shared by the NYPD has been given to us in the past as around 4,000. So can we look at that number or do you have to go back and look on, on all the data in order to come back and share with us the accurate number? I think, council member, I think we're, we're talking about probably two different data sets. So let me take a look at the testimony you're talking about and let us get back to you and we'll clarify any misunderstanding. I think okay. the number that you're citing is injuries. Um, we're citing, we're giving you, we're agreeing that that was the number of injuries. Then we're also giving you the subset of jobs where that were critical injuries, likely to die or deaths, where CIS was deployed. That's the smaller, the 374 that we're giving you. But if there's a misunderstanding as to the numbers, at the end of this hearing, we'll take a look at the testimony you're referring to, and I'll reach out to you and we'll reconcile the number. That's fine. And, and again, those numbers are the new number that I'm bringing. Those are the number that the previous chief, Morris and Shan, and if you look on newspaper that have written about crashes, those are the numbers that you will see in the newspaper. That the crashes average has been 44,000 and the numbers of people in critical condition have been around 4,000 and the people dying every week have been an average of one per week. So this is your number. So if you, again, can be printed uh, by, by in, in some of the media, uh, so more than happy again to share uh, and get, you know, whatever number is that you have to look at. How many, from the 69,000 injury, how many of those cases were investigated by the collision investigation squad? Repeat that question again, please. From those numbers that you share, the C, you said 69,000, when you go deeply in 2019, how many of those cases were investigated? by the Coalition Investigation and Squad Unit. So of the 60,930, 349 were investigated by the uh, Collision Investigation Squad. Why, why is it? Because do you, do you have no men and women in the unit? Or of course, everyone, as a former teacher that I was, and anyone in any job, you would say, we always welcome more resources. And we always can do better if we have more. But if you're thinking about our reality here, with those numbers that you share, let's say last year, in, 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 even from the average of crashes, uh, 2019, 210,000, that is a little bit surprised because the numbers were higher before, before COVID than last year that you share 111,000. 111,000 last year. So what you have seen is that what we talked about that there were more crashes last year, it looked that there were less. But whatever number it was, don't you think that the 26 people in the collision squad unit is not enough to investigate all those cases? And regardless if the unit is transferred to DOT or stay on the NYPD, that's clear that that number is not enough? Well, I think council member, I'll start off. Um, we just want to be clear of what we're talking 
about because we're throwing a lot of numbers around. And I think at its core, we're, we're having the same conversation we've had over the years about the scope of cases that CIS investigates, right? I think when we talk about the 44,000 number or the 69,000 in 2019 and the 44 in 2020, we're talking about the total number of injuries from a collision. We're not talking about the criteria, which is serious physical injury death um, as a result of a collision where CIS is triggered. So that, that larger number, we, we seem to be throwing a lot of these numbers around. And I know the point you're trying to get at is you're trying to have CIS respond to more jobs, right? And unless I'm misunderstanding you. And you no, I, I'm, using, I'm using your number. I'm using the number that you have shared with us in the past. The number that you have shared with us before this hearing was that we have 4,000 individuals in critical condition every year as a result of crashes. That's your number. And so my question is, can how many of those 4,000 of people in critical condition, how many of those cases have been able to be investigated? And how many of those investigated have been closed, finding those drivers guilty when they go through the court system? Council member, I don't think that number is accurate. And I promise you that at the end of the hearing, I'll look back at the testimony that you're referring to but critical injuries would trigger CIS. And we, I don't think the number of 4,000 critical injuries is accurate because for that year, we have 374 CIS jobs. Those are the critical injury likely to die or death that would have triggered CIS. But listen, look at the numbers. I'll, I'll up, I'll, I know you're citing to a prior testimony. Unfortunately, I don't have the transcript of that testimony in front of me, but at the end of the hearing, I committed to you that I will review that transcript and I'll call your office and we'll reconcile whatever the discrepancy is with the numbers. But I can tell you that we do not have 4,000 critical injuries that would have triggered a CIS response. That I can tell you with a degree of confidence. That's fine, we can work with that plan. Let's, let's look at the number. And, but even if we look at the number that you're sharing right now, that last year, 245 people died as a result of crashes. And then in 2019, 220 people died as a result of crashes. Yes, think about, yes, 222, 245 died last year. I'm not an expert in this field. But just think about like, when you look at people being seriously hurt, if the number ended with 245 dying, yes, imagine that the number has to be much higher with the other who, are, who, does, who, are not, who doesn't get killed, but, but they get uh, seriously injured. So but more than happy to share with you. But even when you look at the 245 people who died last year, how many of those cases were and uh, after being investigated by the collision investigation squad unit and working with the DA, with those drivers found guilty. If you added that again for last year or for 2019, and I also know that it takes longer than what we want because there's so many pieces related to the investigation. So I'm not expecting to push you against the wall saying, I want for you to tell me right now that all those cases that started being investigated last year have been already closed. But in average, what percentage of those cases investigated by the collision squad unit ended with people or being able to make the case, taking to the DA and finding those drivers guilty? So we wouldn't have the guilty because that's a verdict. I mean, that's not a police number. <laughs> but we can certainly give you the number of individuals that were arrested. Uh, so once we have a CIS response to the 374 uh, critical uh, injury likely to die in death uh, crashes, uh, we work with the DA as the chief and, and the commissioner from DOT testified. We, um, we present the evidence that the, um, that the CIT investigators compiled from the scene 
uh, the interviews, the physical evidence, DNA, biological, whatever evidence we find, video evidence, we present it to the relevant DA's office, depending on the borough, and we work together to see if there is enough, uh, enough probable cause, if there is probable cause to make an arrest. And that's where we would get the arrest number from. Okay. Do you see a scenario where the unit can continue being led by someone? Again, we expertise in the investigation field from the NYPD by still being under DOT? I mean, respectfully, I, I, I don't because we're, we're talking about, so, I mean, this is probably the sixth or the seventh hearing this month, you know, that, that we've testified at. And there's a lot of reforms and ideas on uh, tasks or things that the NYPD does that may or may not or shouldn't still reside with the NYPD. For example, we did a, a hearing on press passes and whether the NYPD should still be in the business of issuing press passes or uh, a hearing on whether or not the NYPD should have a primary response to people in emotional crisis. Uh, those are conversations that we should have, and we have those conversations at hearings. But what we're talking about now is core law enforcement responsibilities. You're talking about situations where police officers have to respond to the scene and give a field sobriety test, which you have to be a police officer to do. A uh, situation where a police officer has to make an arrest right at the scene. A situation where an officer has to question somebody and develop evidence in real time to make a stronger prosecution. A situation where a police officer has to close off and protect the scene of a crime scene and preserve those as the pieces of evidence so evidence doesn't get contaminated so the district attorney can actually prosecute a criminal case. These are core responsibilities of law enforcement. And I think we're going a little bit too far when we're talking about peeling away core law enforcement responsibilities and starting to farm it out to other agencies. We each have a role. The NYPD certainly does, are not the experts in doing an analysis of of street design or street safety. That's something that's certainly DOT's core responsibility. And we work with DOT uh, at the scene of these uh, crashes to determine not only is there a criminal prosecution here, but did the design of the street uh, provide a contributing factor or could the street be redesigned to, to prevent future collisions from happening? So I think we all have a but okay. preserving evidence, investigating crimes, making arrests, um, you know, I think that's, I know uh, that that's And I'm sorry, it's not one to cut you off, but it's only because of the time. Yeah. It, it, it look, I, of course, you, is your job to make the case? Is that our job to continue, you know, making our case on how we feel, you know, that we should make the reforming again? Uh, at the end of the day, I hope that we can come out with something in the middle when all of us continue doing a job and improving safety in our street. Uh, so, and, and, and I just want for you guys to be open with the possibility on how can we, can we be a scenario where this unit continue being led by the person that is leading right now with the men and women who are trained from the NYPD, but be under the DOT for the purpose of coordination. So is that something that you will see some positive side that you can see that this is something that probably can also happen? I mean, I think that, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think that uh, police officers should be under the direction of another agency. Police officers should be under the direction of the police department and the police commissioner. But that does not mean that there can't be, or frankly, there is already a task force and a collaborative effort with DOT where each of us play a role in examining a crash scene and we leverage our individual expertise 
to ensure that okay. one, there's justice. Who, who, who is the person? That we redesign, or if there's a potential to redesign the roadways to make it safer and prevent. Okay. So you, you, don't, you don't think that that should, and I get it. So your position is that no, that you will not see that that unit can be transferred with the same person in charge that you have right now, with the same men and women trained by the NYPD by yes being on the BOT. I get a part and I saw that we can leave the window open to continue that conversation. It, who is the person that lead the CIS today? Is that person with you right now? Yes, yes myself. Uh, okay. How many how many men or women do you have in that unit? We have 22 detectives and uh, five sergeants. Okay. How do you handle it with that small number, all those large numbers of crashes, people dying, serious condition? Do you need more? We're able to give each investigation the uh, amount of time it, it uh, requires, and we investigate it thoroughly. Uh, the manpower we have now is adequate. Listen, that's a problem that we have, guys. And you have to do your job with what you have. It's like on the Melissa Maverito, we asked to have more men and women in YPD. And of course, the commissioner to say, no, we don't need more. Then we negotiated, made your commissioner say, that's good that we have more. How, how you as a person in charge to lead that unit is saying that 26 is enough? Uh, this is because I've seen these cases get investigated to, uh, you know, thoroughly. That's how I'm saying that based on the number of we are investigating, yeah. That's why, that's why we, we don't have trust. If the person leading this unit is saying that 26 is enough, how can you see at the face of those family? Council member, I think- know that you don't have enough men and women power to investigate the unit. Council member, I mean, we're, we're, we're really talking about two different things here. We're talking, what the Lieutenant is talking about is based on the cases that CIS currently investigates, the, his level of manpower is sufficient to adequately and professionally investigate each one of those cases. What you're talking about, and this is a conversation we've had in past hearings as well, is that the number of overall cases that CIS responds to, you're saying should be enlarged and become and, and be more. And I understand that distinction, but I just want to be clear that what the lieutenant is talking about is having a sufficient number of investigators currently to investigate the cases that are assigned to CIS today. How many, how many of those, how many of those investigations have been resolved? So if, if you, if you're talking about in 2020, the 374 cases that were referred to CIS, out of that 374, there were 78 arrests in 2020. In 2019, out of the CIS, out of the 349 cases that were referred to CIS, 110 uh, were made, were arrests. It's clear that there's not enough men and women power. So, it's clear that, you know, as a person in charge officer, you can say you can do the job. You know, as a teacher, I had to work with 35 students when that was the number that DOE said that I had to work with. Would that make a difference? Instead of working with 35, I could have 15 or 20? But I mean, council member, we're, we're again, we're talking about two different things. No, I'm not sorry, no, sorry. No, no, we are not, no, no. listen, listen, we are not talking about two different things. I'm saying, you will hear from the advocates. You will hear from those families. I've been involved day by day with so many cases. I know by fact, 26 is not enough to investigate those cases. So if we start this conversation, coming from the person in charge to coordinate that unit, when the number is picked by itself, whatever number you look at, it, and he's saying 26 is enough, then definitely New York, New York will have doubt for that. 
I mean, ca council member, again, again, we're, he's talking about the cases. And when you take a look at the arrest numbers, that's cases where you have probable cause to make an arrest, whether you have the number of people he has today or whether he has 5,000 people assigned to him, it won't change the fact that if probable cause to make an arrest doesn't exist, we can't make an arrest. We can only make an arrest where there is probable cause. And we work with our district attorneys to present all of our evidence to see where we have probable cause so they can adequately prosecute somebody. If a case can't be prosecuted, then we can't make an arrest. So that, that's that's the issue. Now, again, we're, we're conflating what the manpower we have today to investigate the cases CIS responds to. And what you're talking about is having CIS respond to a much larger universe of cases for which clearly there would need to be a significant increase in manpower. I, I'm, I mean, speaking about the coalition investigation squad to have enough men and women power to be able to have all those resources to go the investigation. You cannot make a case if you will be in front of a judge or a juror saying that is the same to have 26 as to have 200 to investigate the number that I will keep using because it came from you, 4,000 people in critical condition every year as a result of crashes. And that the unit that is in charge to investigate, the one that we have created on the NYPD is saying that 26 is enough to make the investigation. So definitely we are not speaking the same language and we have a major disagreement with that. Uh, who is who is the counterpart? The counterpart on on, on uh, from the person from the officer who lead the CIS when it comes to DOT. Who do you coordinate every day when it comes to cases that you have to respond as a result of crashes? Well, maybe I can jump in there, Chair. So. Um, the way DOT handles this, we have a group of four emergency response responders. Um, they work from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. every day. And when there's a CIS, we the, the person on duty um, goes to the scene and collects um, some, some information at the scene. So those four people have a strong relationship with the PD CIS unit, and they, they coordinate um, directly. And the person that we send, what, what they do is they take photographs, they look at whether or not there's any DOT infrastructure that needs to immediately be um, addressed that may have contributed to the crash, such as, you know, a signal malfunction or a street defect or something of that nature. And they report back to um, a large team here at DOT what, you know, the preliminary information is that they're seeing at the scene. A com a commissioner, a, is that are those four people part of a unit on the DOT? And, yes, who, they, and, who, and who coordinate that unit and what is the name of that department? Okay, that unit is our Office of Emergency Response and they have a number of different functions. They um, work with us 24 seven in a, in a radio room, um, basically providing the whole department with lots of conditions that affect DOT, um, but it's embedded within that unit. And who coordinated that unit? That unit is coordinated by our assistant commissioner, Sharita Hunter, who reports to our deputy commissioner, Leon Hayward. So that person coordinate day by day with the person who lead the coalition investigation squad unit? Um, there, I won't say that there is day by day coordination. The staff on the ground have day by day coordination, but, but we do work very closely with PD on, on all of the crashes and then a different unit comes into play. Um, Anne Marie Doherty is on um, this hearing today with us. Her unit follows up and does a lot of data analysis and coordination with NYPD in order to inform um, our street improvement projects and, and much of the work that we do. Uh, Commissioner, how many of those uh, intersections or area where crashes have happened in the last couple of years, we can choose any year whatever is the one that you have data with you. Uh, it could be last year if you have it, but because also projects take time, it could be, you know, 2019 or 2018. Right. In how many of those areas where crashes have happened, DOT 
had been able to uh, make those necessary changes when it comes to infrastructure. All right, about, in about 50% of the fatal crash locations, we do make changes. Now that takes out the fatalities on highways, which are sort of a different animal, but on, on all the street locations, about 50% um, ha have some sort of treatment, whether it's a change in signal timing, a complete redesign, study for a traffic signal, all sorts of things. Does any area where crashes happen in the street, putting aside the highway, we can immediately part of DOT to do an analysis if they have to make a, of a change in those areas? Right, so I mentioned what our emergency response group does. So they go out immediately. Then we have another group um, that goes out. It's, again, it's about only four or five people. They go out within several days or possibly several weeks. And that group does a little bit more in-depth look at the location. What they'll do is pull um, signal timing, um, the signal timing for the intersection, the pavement marking designs. They'll look at whether or not there's any upcoming work. Um, they'll go out to the location and they'll lay out um, exactly how the intersection currently looks or the location currently looks. Um, and they'll bring that back for a more in-depth look. So we have, we have two, two steps basically, a very immediate step and then one that follows. Okay. But it, the, the way of how, it, and of course, I've been an honor to be working with all of you guys, it, it led by DOT and YPD and, and others when it comes to Vision Zero. And, and I also know that we have made important improvement. We are just looking for a, a expanding what we've been doing and, and, and how to address the epidemic, which is not only COVID, but also it's also about crashes. It, it, as it is right now, DOT doesn't have to uh, respond immediately when the crash happens, right? Um, NYPD takes care of the situation. We do respond to the vast majority of them. Okay, but they are the ones who respond immediately. They Correct. know this is not something in coordination with DOT immediately being told this thing happened like the, the hit and run that happened this morning, right? In yes. Brooklyn, and immediately NYPD DOT get information together and both agencies had to send someone to the scene, right? Correct. We, we okay. were there this morning at that scene. No, but I say the, the way I think that's happening is right now, DOT, if you look about those for those different departments that you have, uh, uh, the Office of Emergency Respond, as you say, this is 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., but when any crash happened, DOT doesn't have to be there at the scene. NYPD is the one that got there first, and then they share some information, DOT, and then DOT move on and send some members to that scene. Is that what it is? Yes, NYPD takes the initial responses. Correct. Okay, so what we want to follow is some other city that they are already like a Seattle model. They're looking to see how DOT immediately, you know, go to the scene as the crash happened, to look from the perspective of the investigation, but also from the perspective of the need to redesign our street. As you know, a, a, a lot of things have happened in the last couple of years, and we have been in places that sometimes it's not only what an individual would like to do in the role that they play, but it's about the priority that we have in the city, in this case, led by the mayor. So, that's my part. So closing from my end in this part of my question, then I will be going to my, uh, to my colleague. If I think that what we are looking right now, again, is to see how this unit that is in charge of investigation, uh, one from my end, whatever it is, it could be the investigation squad, uh, invest the, the collection investigation squad could be Let's say on the NYPD, it could be on the DOT. The first thing is that 26 people is not enough. And for me, I have a big issue when I heard from the person in charge of the unit saying that that's enough. And when I heard that it doesn't matter, it doesn't make a difference. The unit had 26 or that had 200, that it doesn't make a difference. So for the purpose of investigation. So this is something that definitely, I know this is not only my concern, but it's the concern of those families that has a loved one involved in the crashes. Uh, 
last question to me is, how many of those cases uh, uh, or crashes being referred to be investigation, investigated by the, uh, from the, by the coalition investigation squad? In 2020, there were 374 cases that were investigated by the collision investigation squad. I'm sorry, can you repeat that number if you don't mind? In 2020, Chair, there were 374 cases that were investigated by the collision investigation squad. But that number that, that's number as you say, those, those are numbers that you say that when you look at 2020, you say that we have 111,000 crashes, 374 in critical condition, and 245 dead. No, council members. So we, we, we really need to straighten these numbers out because we're throwing a lot of numbers and, and this is being conflated. There were 111,000 crashes total, whether there's a physical injury or no physical injury, 111,000 crashes. Right, it could have been property damage only. That could, that's part of that number. When you look at the 374 CIS cases that were investigated in 2020, of that 374, uh, 245 resulted in death. So it's not 374 plus 245. The 245 is within that 374. No, I understand it, but, it, and again, this number is important. Yeah. It, it, and, and of course, like, I know we're going back to the other pieces about the 44,000, and, and I hope that we can compare, is my interest. But even if we look, let's say, stay with this number, the number, as you say, you say 111,000 crashes. It could be that crash happened. My car was parked in front of the church. I came back the day after, I know that someone hit my car. And I was not inside the car. I didn't get to get a report. And no, that's a case that was not documented. But it could be, let's say, if I could make the call, right, and, and report to the local prison, then that case would be a crash, even though there was not one, no one inside the car. So I get that point. Some cases are related to damage to vehicle. And, and, and among the 111,000. But then, and then you say 374 critical investigators, as you say right now, investigating by the coalition investigation squad and 245 people who died, right? So the thing that I feel where we need to, and I need you help to look at it, is because the 374 investigated by the coalition investigating squad, right? It look, if we just use that number, what we are saying is that every case of people in that end, the cases that ended with people in critical conditions are investigating, investigated by the coalition investigation squad. And we know that, so that's a disparity in that particular case. So 374 are the number of people being, or cases of being investigated. How many has not, how many cases do we have of the other critical that have not been investigated by the squad? It's not, it's not critical. But, and this is, this is the problem. I, I think this is the issue with some of the statements that are being made. If it's critical injury out of the 374, critical injury that the person did not die is 128, 128 individuals. 245 individuals died. So that makes up the 128 plus the 245 equal 374, right? That's, that's that universe. What you're talking about is not injuries that are not critical injuries. So there's a collision that resulted in injuries that did not rise to the level of critical. And those jobs are not investigated by CIS. So when the Lieutenant was talking about having enough resources to investigate, he's talking about the 374 cases. 
and having enough investigators to investigate the 374 cases. What you're talking about is, in addition to the 374, you're talking about all collisions that resulted in an injury that didn't rise to the level of critical injury. And the lieutenant was not talking about those cases. He's only talking about the 374 that he investigates. Okay, which are the criteria of people being hurt in crashes? Can you describe that have not, are not in the red flag for the CIS to start an investigation? So yes, and so I think it's very important to talk about the, the cra uh, crash when it occurs. So uh, a patrol officer would respond to a crash and then that would trigger EMS and EMS would determine the criteria of that injury. And based upon the criteria of that injury, a patrol, a supervisor would be responding to that particular crash or collision. And then it's a determination of based upon the injury, if it's serious or if it's critical, uh, there would be a notification to uh, evidence collection team or a notification to CIS. Now CIS would get all of those cases or notification where the person is seriously injured and likely to die, critically injured, or death. Those cases where EMS has a triage that the injury is serious would actually go to the detective squad. If there's an injury, may I continue? If there's an injury and the person has left the scene, that particular uh, case would also go to the detective squad. Okay, I, I think that, you know, what I was intention to, again, to be positive in this conversation, what I feel is that definitely beside the hearing, we definitely should have a meeting uh, with more time, with more details so that we can compare data. It's not intention to, you know, make NYPD for me to look back. For me, this is about, we, it doesn't matter if it's NYPD or DOT. We know that we've been doing great coordination with Vision Zero. We all the chief, including you, Chief Chan, Chief Morris, and uh, Commissioner Paul Trump in the past. And now we also the Deputy Commissioner here too. Uh, so let's, you know, I, I will give you that. My two question, and then I definitely will go back to my colleague. Uh, when when a representative when 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 a representative from the coalition squad investigation squad arrive at the scene, does your guy take or does your officer take the statements of all the survival of everyone involved in the crash? So when uh, the collision investigation squad responds to the scene with our collision technician group, yes, they're responsible for taking uh, statements from witnesses, as well as all individuals that are involved in the crash. So we're 100% sure that when a crash happened and the unit arrive, that unit doesn't leave until they take the statement of everyone involved in that crash. I mean, council member, every, everybody in the police department that responds, whether it's detectives or whether it's CIS team, they're trained to one safeguard the crime scene, to preserve the evidence, to make sure the scene doesn't get contaminated, to do a search for video if there's cameras around, to interview witnesses. I mean, that's what they're trained to do. That, that, that's, that's the investigation. Yeah, so, so but uh, in this particular case, as a unit that will be following up, and I understand that the importance of coordination in any place that we work, but when the crash happened and the units arrive at the scene, that unit is the one that take the statement of the individual hurt in that crash. Does the unit stay there until the statements are taken from anyone uh, who are a survivor of a crash? They would be responsible, CIS would be responsible for taking 
statements, as well as speaking to the detective squad that's at the scene, as well as following up if there are any statements that are not taken at that time, because the investigation would be ongoing and open. So but I say, but be with me. Yeah. If cross up, let's say, my community or any place in the five borough, the coalition investigation squad go to the unit. There's three passengers in the car. That unit will be the one that will be following of the investigation. Those the members of the unit stay there until they take the statement or the survival of a crash. I mean, council member, every I'm I'm not trying to avoid your question, but it's uh, I'm really not sure where you're where you're going with this. There could be the, I'm going on to on to the follow up of, of the investigation. No, so I, I, I don't understand. but the every case can take different turns. So you can have witnesses that are removed from the scene by EMS and they can't be interviewed at the scene and they're going to be followed up on at a later time. When I get it, but I understand that piece, but I say by if they are in the scene and if they can talk, yeah, no, you know, segregating the question, I get those pieces. Right. The so one can, those people who are in the car that they can talk. The unit stay there until they take the statement of those people who survive. Who survived the crash? Yeah, the relevant investigators are responsible for interviewing all witnesses. Okay, okay. Uh, last question, Commissioner. This is something big, and DOT is an agency. Again, very proud to be working with you. Before I was a chair, before you had this responsibility, when you used to be. Again, the Manhattan Commissioner, and happy happy to be working with all of you, from Rebecca, from Pink, everyone. It's a great team. It, it's big to follow the shoes of Polly Trumbo. What experience does a new DOT Commissioner bring that will guarantee us that he's ready? Experience on transportation. Okay. Um, the new commissioner in the last three weeks that he's been here has absolutely jumped in um, to all aspects of the department. We've briefed him on many things and he's made it um, very clear what his vision and direction is. He comes with experience um, from Brooklyn Bridge Park and the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And in the weeks that we've gotten to know him, we believe he's going to have a very great impact on the department. But this is about project that we're doing. But when he comes, mm -hmm. what is his background? Okay. Well, I can tell you for the projects that we're doing, we have the whole DOT team here that is continuing to do this great work. He is bringing his direction and leadership to it, which we have seen to be very strong direction. And I'm sure, you know, he would be very interested in meeting and talking with you further about all of that. Yeah, I, I just believe that this is, I guess, you know, top priority transportation. Mm -hmm. And of course, I'm not gonna call for him. So uh, it's not that I ask him for the phone call, but I feel that different from the previous commissioner, that immediately, even in areas that I don't, uh, I'm not immediately responsible. And, 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 and of course, like for me, I was very surprised when we have someone like you, we have a lot of spirits in, inside the agency and, and suddenly someone that doesn't have any experience on transportation is a big surprise to me, especially when we are still working in the couple of months to finish our goal of Vision Zero. Okay, well, let me just say one more thing on that. He in his career has gotten a lot of big things done and maybe they weren't all direct. I, I know he does have, um, through some of his work um, in the two projects I just cited, does have good familiarity um, with, with transportation issues as well as he was on our BQE expert panel and dived into that very deeply. Um, but he brings with him the ability to make things happen and push forward a large organization such as DOT. And we think that will be very helpful in this year when we have so much to accomplish. Okay. I, I'm always open to opportunity, but I have concern that someone that doesn't have any background when it comes to especially Vision Zero and everything that we are addressing is a person that now is leading the agency. Again, I'm open to work as I have done it with everyone. And I hope again that you know, we are into the aggress a, a more aggressive plan when it comes to try to finish a lot of the big projects that we have in mind, especially on how to make the streets safer 
for pedestrian and cyclists. So with that, let's go back now to my colleague. Thank you, Chair. Um, first, we'll hear from the co-prime sponsors of the bill, uh, Council Members Levin and Lander, followed by Council Member Holden. Um, Council Member Levin. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Council, and thank you, Chair. Um, so uh, I appreciate everybody's um, attendance here. I, I, I want to just kind of make sure that I understand, um, and I, I know that you spoke a lot of this, about a lot of this with uh, Chair, Chair Rodriguez, but I just want to make sure that I understand where things are. So um, I started looking at um, the AIS squad way back when it was AIS, before it was CIS. Um, this would have been about um, seven or eight years ago, maybe eight, eight nine years ago. Um, and at the time, the, uh, the criteria for investigation um, by CIS was that there had to be a death or injury that would lead to death. Um, what has changed since then in terms of the criteria for uh, an investigation by CIS? And, 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 and also how has the number of cases investigated changed? So if you said that there was about 345, I think, uh, cases that were investigated in 2020. Um, how many were investigated in 2012, for example, back when it was AIS and not CIS? Good morning, Councilmember Levin. Um, morning. So I would not have the data that goes back to 2012 at this time. Um, the data that I have goes back to 2018. But I can tell you that uh, since uh, we have changed the name to Collision Investigation Squad from AIS, Accident Investigation Squad, there is a component that the Collision Investigation Squad investigates, which is critical. Um, previously, the seriously injured likely to die or death. And now there is a level of critical. And that's determined by a medical profession professional or EMS at the scene. Yeah, so how many- There's also, Council, um, just, to, just to add uh, one point, there's also a mechanism that was created in addition to critical about having a captain or above at the scene be able to trigger CIS response uh, if, the if that supervisor determines the situation warrants. Okay, so- um... I mean, it would be definitely helpful to, to know, to see data prior to when that change was implemented, um, this, the AAS, the CIS, to see, you know, obviously if you're adding a criteria of critical um, to serious and likely to die and, and death, then you would see um, an expansion in the number of investigation in any given year, I would, I would assume. Um, not not so, necessarily, because you, why not? there was a significant decrease, uh, thankfully, in the number of uh, traffic fatalities, and I think that's attributed to, you know, the administration's push to Vision Zero and the collaboration between the council and, and the administration, but the number of the types of cases, um, and I will follow up with you and get you the total I mean, numbers, but yeah. not necessarily correlated that when you expand the criteria, the number of investigation expands because you can have a contraction of the numbers of cases that rise to death, which is something we're actually hoping for. Perhaps. Um, I don't necessarily think that, I don't want to make that an assumption. Um, you know, perhaps. Um, uh, my... Uh, the other question I have is that um, how, how many how many um, critical injuries resulted from car crashes in New York City? Do we have? I, I think that the chair mentioned a, a number that was much higher than than three hundred and forty five. How, how many do we? Uh, how many cases like that have happened in any given year in the last few years? So 2020, it was one hundred and twenty eight. 
So out of the 374 investigated by- No, 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 I'm sorry, that's not what I'm asking. That's not what I'm asking. I'm asking how many people went to the emergency room from a car crash with critical injuries in 2020 or 2019? Well, what you're, I mean, again, this is important. I'm not asking, I'm not asking how many were, were I'm not, I'm not, I'm trying to arrive at it well, a different way. One, one feeds into the other, that's my point. I'm not trying to dodge your question. I'm saying if it's labeled as a critical injury, when you're using the term critical injury, that yeah. also triggers a CIS response. So if we're gonna use that word of critical injury, CIS is responding. So we have 128 critical injuries that did not result in death in 2020. And we have 245, I, I, you can say critical injuries that did result in death. So the universe right. is- and I'm, I'm wondering if that is lining up, I'm wondering oh, like if that is lining up with what, um, if that's lining up with what we're, the, the number of critical cases that come into emergency rooms from from crashes in New York City, is, is that is that number then, that's the number of critical injuries from the fire department, from EMS? Well, I mean- that if, if we were to ask the fire department how many critical injuries resulted from car crashes in 2020, they would say three, no more than 345? Right. We're, well, the critical status is deemed by EMS at the scene. So when you use that word, I mean, that, yeah. the numbers should correlate because that we're not the ones where we're not medical professionals. We're not making that determination of critical. That's something that's coming from the medical professional at the scene. That every single time that EMS says that it's critical, CIS is on the scene to do the investigation. Is that right? That's correct. That's correct. Um, and, and the definition of critical is, is what? That would, that would be a determination by EMS. They would triage the injury and actually tell us whether or not it's critical. We would not make that determination. Um, okay, but is there a is there a, a a guide at EMS that that defines what critical is? I mean, we'll defer we'll defer that question to the experts. Uh, I'm not aware of it, so I, I really don't want to speak to it. I mean, just as an example, I mean, we saw um, uh, just yesterday um, uh, Tiger Woods had a had a serious crash in in California um, where. Um, you know, he, he suffered serious injuries. Is that, is that, would that, would that level of crash rise to the level of a CIS investigation? I mean, if that, if that crash should have, would have happened in New York City and EMS would have determined that it was critical, CIS would be responding to the job. Yeah. I mean, I'm just wondering if how, how we define, how we define um, critical. I mean, is it, um, is it, 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 it is not, I mean, I would think that if somebody's, what would be another, what would be an alternative definite, what would be an, um, an, an expanded category from critical? What's the next category below critical? I mean, again, that I don't, we're not experts in making these designations. We're reacting to the designations when they're made by medical experts. So I'll defer, I mean, we can, <laughs> Right. Yeah, I, 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 I hear you. What I'm, what I'm trying to say is it's, that seems like an awfully low number of investigations in a year, 345. It, it is, there are a lot of cases where, pe where people have injury, where there may have been some criminal conduct on the part of one of the parties in a crash. And if we're just investigating crashes where people have died or people are suffering critical injuries where the definition is, um, you know, potentially life-threatening. Okay, Council, um, let, me, let me stop you for a second. That, that's not what we said. So we're talking about a distinction between a CIS response and mm -hmm. a detective bureau response. So we're not saying we're not investigating the others. We're saying critical injury likely to die and death is a response by CIS that do that investigation 
And if you don't have, uh, if you have a, a crash that does not rise to that level, one, you can have a captain or above full CIS, but let's assume mm -hmm. it doesn't get to that. They that. don't. Right. Yeah. Then you have detective bureau uh, evidence collection teams that are specially trained as well, and they're responding to the scene to do that. So they're specially trained to do to do in 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 uh, crash investigation techniques. Well, highway uh, within ECT within evidence collection teams in the detective bureau, highway has uh, done training to 100, 143, 143, 45. What does uh, that, that training consist of? It's uh, photography, measurements. Uh, I mean, they're already trained in preservation of crime scenes and collection of evidence. They are called the evidence collection team, of course. So, but Highway, in addition to that, gives them additional training on uh, photography and measurements relative to crashes. What would be the benefit of not having, what, what would be the benefit of having the detectives bureau investigate rather than CIS? Why not, why not expand CIS to investigate more cases of serious injury? Um, why, why give that responsibility to, um, to detectives that receive, you know, some level of training, but obviously not the same level of training as, as, as detectives in the CIS? Well, it's, I mean, I guess it's, it's like anything else, right? You have an elite specialized unit that has a significant amount of training, a significant amount, and the chief... I'm not going to repeat it because the chief went over it in her prepared remarks, but those individuals, you know, the, the most horrific cases are investigated by those individuals, right? And then the other cases that are not, not to detract from the seriousness of the other cases, you have each also specially trained uh, investigators investigating those cases as well. But it's like any other any other issue. You're triaging and you're leveraging the specially trained expertise in the most efficient way possible. And you're starting with critical injury, likely to die, death. Uh, you know. And right. I, I think I'm just. I, I think what I, the issue the the issue that I'm taking with that is that there's a there's a as you just described it. There's an emphasis on efficiency, and. Um, Efficiency and effectiveness are, you know, sometimes are at, at odds a little bit. Uh, they can be. Um, and um, if we are prioritizing efficiency and not prioritizing effectiveness, that, that could be in, at, at odds. I, I want, and I don't, that's just my characterization. You don't have to agree with that. Uh, one, one last question, then I'll turn it back to, to my colleagues. Um, what was, what's the number of, um, of, of detectives in CIS right now? 22. 22. How has that number changed over the last 10 years? It has fluctuated between uh, 16 and 20. Uh, so we're right, uh, right in the middle. Okay, so it's never been, and, and when was it 16? Probably back in uh, 2012, when you're talking about prior to uh, Okay. So it did expand by about 50 or 60% from that time, is what you're saying? Yes. Um, okay. I, I mean, I do think that, um, I mean, I would be interested to know um, what, what kind of cases are not, are not getting covered by CAS and what the outcome of those cases are. Have there, I mean, sorry, last question here. Are, have there been criminal charges brought in any cases in, in the last few years that were not, were, were ones investigated by the Detectives Bureau and not CIS? Of course. I, mean, I don't have the exact number, but it's, I mean, of course, there, there's no doubt about it. Leaving the scene uh, leaving the scene cases, we 
Well, leaving the scene, let's let's let let's let's no, leave the leaving the scene aside no, for a second. Injury. We're talking about with an injury. So the universe. Right, but leaving the scene does not does not take um any type of that that doesn't take in you know a special investigative skill to determine if somebody left the scene. For 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 yeah, for, those for are probably uh, some of the hardest cases to investigate. I mean, I would strongly disagree with you because when somebody leaves the scene, that to place a, an individual behind the wheel of the car at the time of the incident is extremely difficult. And I, you know, those okay, are but, not but, easy cases. No, okay, okay, very. I, I'm not going to argue with that, but. Um, what I mean to say is, you know, one, uh, cases that involve um, uh, other types of uh, forensic evidence collection, you know, um, uh, uh, things like uh, speeding, running a red light, um, uh, other types of reckless driving, um, things that, in, in other words, like behaviors that led up to the crash, not sub not subsequent to the crash itself. Are there being criminal charges brought in? Of any of those types of criminal charges brought against somebody involved in a crash that was not investigated by CIS? Yes, there has. So, as we were speaking before, all invest all crash and in with injuries or all crashes are investigated. But there are times when there is a crash or a collision, and the patrol officer responds and determines that that individual is intoxicated or impaired, there would be an arrest, or that person is unlicensed, it would be an arrest, and also if that person failed to yield to a pedestrian. So those are some of the cases where that arrest would, that particular case would not rise to the level of CIS, but there's still an arrest. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll turn it back over to my chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Levin. Um, next, we'll hear from the other co-prime sponsor, Councilmember Lander. Uh, Councilmember Lander will be followed by Councilmember Holden and Councilmember Miller. Councilmember Lander. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair Rodriguez, for convening this uh, important hearing. And I'm honored to be one of the co-sponsors of this bill, which I, uh, I believe is really urgently needed. Like Councilmember Levin, I have spent you know, a, a, a long part of my more than decade in the council pushing to win uh, some changes here. Um, and we have made a few small steps. You know, we got the AIS renamed to, you know, from accident investigation squad to collision investigation squad. That took a lot of work. And the increase, you know, now back in the Bloomberg administration that was made. And I'll, and I'll say that there have been some other meaningful uh, steps. You know, I, I want to invoke the, the memory of Deputy Inspector Mike Ameri who uh, was a great partner to us both at the 78th Precinct um, and when he was at NYPD Highway. Um, and so I know that it's possible for there to be law enforcement that helps combat reckless driving and reduce it. Um, and I also wanna say thank you to DOT for uh, working to restore funding in the executive budget and move forward on the Reckless Driver Accountability Act, which I believe is a groundbreaking way of combating reckless driving. But, but having said all that, uh, that decade has not left, oh, and I should say we also work to try to make the right of way law uh, a way for the NYPD to start engaging on combating reckless behaviors so we could actually reduce reckless driving and save lives. And I, I want to start there because accountability is critical, uh, arrests and, and where there is um, loss of life or injury caused by reckless drivers, um, there needs to be real justice and accountability. But the goal here is to save lives, reduce crashes, prevent injuries. And we could be doing that. And honestly, I just feel that we are not. And that the approach that CIS has taken has not gotten serious about that. And that's why I believe it makes sense to move primary responsibility to DOT so that the core goal will be, yes, in part justice and accountability, but also an approach that combats reckless driving through engineering changes, through education changes, through enforcement changes, and saves lives. So I want to start with a question about, you know, that Reckless Driver Accountability Act began with the horrific crash in Park Slope a couple of years ago that killed a one-year-old and a four-year-old. And the driver, Dorothy Bruns, who killed them, um, she had been in a prior crash, actually, in a hit and run uh, that was investigated, but not by CIS. It was investigated by a precinct in Queens. 
And I guess I, I just want to start by asking the NYPD, what, what happened with that hit and run investigation not done by CIS of Dorothy Bruns's earlier hit and run? Yeah, council member, we, we don't have information about that particular case, but we can circle back with you. So, so I know what happened in that particular case, and I, and I think you guys do too. It, it's set in a file drawer in the precinct. So I don't know whether the detective who went out to investigate it had been trained by CIS or not, um, but it was one of the cases. It was a hit and run. So it involved a, a driver in a car hitting a pedestrian. Um, and thank God that pedestrian was not killed. Um, and I don't know whether she was, uh, or that pedestrian was, was critically injured or, or likely to die. But that case was investigated and the investigation report led to no prosecution, no action, no effort to take away uh, Ms. Bruns's car or license. Um, it sat in a file drawer. It didn't go into it as far as I understand. It didn't even make it into a computer database. It sat on paper in a file drawer in a Queens precinct while she stayed out on the road, draw, you know, got five red light speeding violations. Nobody did anything until the day when she killed Abigail and Joshua. Um, so what I have observed is we aren't, we don't have a serious approach to using enforcement to adding up to saving future lives. And that's why the refusal to think about expanding the collision investigation squad investigations seems so short-sighted to me. Let's not argue about the definitions of what's critical. And if we had to go from 300 to 3,600, we would need 10 times the staff. You could do twice as many investigations with twice as much staff. And if that was part of like focused deterrence of learning, who are the people that are most likely to injure and kill? And therefore, how could we organize an enforcement approach that was likely to save lives? It seems to me if we did twice as many investigations, we would know twice as much. Um, so I guess let me start there. I mean, is that, am I, am I making that assumption wrong? I mean, if CIS investigated twice as many crashes, wouldn't it be possible to have twice as large a database of reckless driving and connect that with a broader deterrence uh, and prevention strategy? I mean, I don't know if, I, I really don't know if I can confirm that conclusion, right? So CIS are, and just like detectives in the squad, their responsibility is to go to the scene, preserve and collect evidence uh, and build a case if a case warrants for criminal prosecution. So what, what the, that collection of evidence and what the outcome of that investigation would show, will it show a significant increase in reckless driving or not? It may, I, I just couldn't tell you without examining every case, case by case. So that actually gets directly to the point I wanna make and the next question I wanna ask because in other areas of policing, uh, NYPD takes a, a focused deterrence approach. You think about um, what you know and how you can use it to address and prevent other crimes. Um, you know, that's, as I understand it, like a whole, a, a big part of the whole kind of Comstat idea. Um, but here, I don't see that at all. I don't see an effort to use enforcement to reduce or combat reckless driving more broadly um, so I guess let me ask it that way. Like, is there a strategy that I'm not seeing that CIS is engaged in to use the information from the collision investigations in concert with other data to make people safer from getting killed or injured in crashes beyond the individual officer investigation of that case one at a time? Well, Councilman Lander, I'll respond to that. And to answer your question, yes, there is a holistic approach not just focusing on CIS, but the entire police department when it comes to driving down fatalities and making sure our streets are safe. One is that at the precinct level, the executive officer, as well as the traffic safety team is responsible for looking at uh, collisions and collisions that involve injuries. Uh, they are also part of a traffic safety forum that I actually oversee every week. And, and not only is it the NYPD, our patrol, our executive officers in the precinct, which are captains, or and our borough, as well as our CIS team, as well as our highway team, and our traffic enforcement district. 
These forums are also attended by Department of Transportation. And the reason for that is to basically talk about what infrastructure issues that we see in those geographical areas that may come to the point where DOT has to do any changes or if there's any signage that needs to take place. In addition to that, also uh, we have MTA that also attends uh, the forums. One of the things that um, we focus on in the forum, even though it's data driven, is doubling down on outreach as well as enforcement. And we have our high vision um, zero corridors that are set up in each borough where we see that there is uh, there are problems as it results in um, a reckless driving, um, failing to yield, or any other violation that may occur in that particular corridor. And we call them corridors because they don't just focus on one precinct, they focus on several precincts within that geographical area. So uh, the outreach, uh, education, as well as engineering, and then definitely enforcement. And you are correct, because enforcement is what's going to change the attitude and the behavior of the motorists. Except if we're only enforcing in the small number of cases we're investigating. Anyway, I, I, I appreciate some parts of that answer, but it doesn't answer what happened in that Queens precinct after the hit and run that let Dorothy Bruns back out to drive around. And I don't see anything different that you're doing now that would prevent that. I, I don't see how you can't then answer that twice as many CIS investigations would, pr would produce twice as much information if you actually have a comprehensive approach um, uh, so, um, but I guess a couple other questions. I mean, um, why is it so difficult to get information from CIS about the, you know, the, you know, each year, the cases you investigate and what you've learned from them precisely for this set of questions that you just outlined? Well, I'm taking consideration that all of the investigations that CIS do are confidential. Uh, there, there is information about the number of investigations and the number of fatalities, but if you're talking about the level of specificity well, of you, investigation, uh, well, you know, I've, but obviously I'm not talking about like, you know, making witnesses, confidential testimonies public. Is there anything that would prevent you from publishing an annual report that doesn't just have, here's how many investigations we conducted, but here's what we learned from them that is enabling us to strengthen enforcement and reduce reckless driving. Did I, did I miss those annual reports? So council member, I think, you know, we've worked with the council and council members and we do Please just, oh, like I, you have definitely I, worked I, with I, us I, in many ways, but on this if question- can, If I can finish, well, I guess I finished my answer. So what I'm saying is, is that we have worked with the council on a number of reports to include CIS specific reporting on a quarterly basis, which not only talks about the number of cases investigated by CIS, but also reports on the investigative steps taken. If you want to go further and, and really dive deeper into additional transparency, we've always partnered with the council and we explore that with you, that there's not, we're not objecting, objecting to further conversations on, on greater transparency. We never have. I, but I, I got it. But what I want in this case is not just greater transparency. What I want is a genuine commitment to using the collision investigation squad and the investigation of more crashes uh, to get us improvements in how, we're, in how we're approaching enforcement and combating reckless driving. And I just haven't seen it. We came up with the Reckless Driver Accountability Act, learning from red light and speed cameras, not because we got any information from CIS that said, hey, you know what? We could have figured out Dorothy Bruns was pretty likely to hit and kill someone again, given her record. And the, I, I think DOT would take, an, take that annual report responsibility with the goal of combating reckless driving in a different way. So I'm just gonna ask one more question because well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry yeah. long time. council member. I'm sorry, this is Margaret for Junior from DOT. If I could just jump in, just sort of trying to get it, I think where you're going with this. The city has our Vision Zero um, website where we publish very detailed data on traffic fatalities and injuries, and that data is very well accessible. That, that gets to part of it. Of course, we also have our borough pedestrian safety action plans that we 
produced periodically, sure. which take that data and then translate it into the, the locations where we most need to focus. So some of what you're getting at is embedded in some of those things we're already doing. I, so I guess what I would say to that is, uh, in terms of focusing on geography, a lot of progress has been made. We know and we look at and we have the data on where crashes occur and then look at what engineering changes can be made to those corridors or intersections. Not, you know, we wanna do more of that. It's not fast enough. It's not ambitious enough. We wanna go further, but at least we have a strategy there. On the strategy of actually combating reckless driving behaviors, we have done almost nothing. Uh, and it is a thing that, you know, the NYPD thinks about in other areas. What do we learn from enforcement so that we can think about the behaviors that are likely to cause New Yorkers harm and we actually are learning a lot about reckless driving behaviors that cause New Yorkers harm, which individuals are most likely to do that. And the ones it turns out that have sped against you know, speed cameras and red lights or the ones who have been in prior hit and runs are pretty likely. Um, and we could learn a lot more if we had a strategic and integrated focus to combat reckless driving, but we don't have it. And that's why I've been pushing to create the Reckless Driver Accountability Act, which is just barely getting started. But I don't see the NYPD, and I've been trying for a decade, that's why we passed the right-of-way law, to get more serious about this. And I just have come to conclude um, that we've got a lot better chance of getting it if we put it all in one agency with the goal of reducing crashes. But my, my last questions for the NYPD go to how you work with, um, with the families of victims. Because another thing that I have just heard time and time again is frustration from the families of victims. First, there's so many cases where the victim is blamed um, a press reporter will come talk to an officer on the scene and get a quote, and then it's in the media. Um, and then they just have a really difficult time getting information, um, getting effects, being able to work with their attorneys to make cases, because in so many cases, you're not going to be able to bring or, you know, there isn't a prosecution and they're relying on a private attorney. So I guess my, my question here is, um, is there a standing panel of, you know, of crash victims' families that advise you on this work so that you can improve the, the approach to make sure that it is doing better by them? So I'll start with the, the outreach to the families of fatalities or uh, involved in the collision. One of the things that I stood up when I became the chief of transportation and within my CIS unit is that all families are engaged by a CIS investigator at the beginning of the investigation. And, and, and the reason for that is that they not only engage the family, but they help the family navigate through this very complicated situation of bereavement, as well as getting information. What's going to take place in the investigation? Who's involved in the investigation? What type of... Um, uh, information will be needed to uh, make an arrest. That, is, that information will be given to the district attorney. They're discussed, there's a discussion about what happens with the district attorney, what roles they play, how we actually engage with the district attorney, the Emmy's office. We also provide the family with um, what we call frequently asked questions about a collision fatality or collision. And this is necessary because uh, most of the time, the families are, 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 are really um, in a state where this is something that they've never encountered, but we want our CIS investigators to help them through this. So those questions are asked. They're also translated in different languages. And we also provide the family with any type of report that's taken by the uh, CIS investigator, which would be the accident report. So they could see what has been recorded. I'm sorry, are we still, we're still calling it an accident report? It is still called an state accident form. report. It's a it's state a, report. It's a state form, sir. So I, we're, I mean, it's not a city form, it's a state form. So um, during our traffic safety form, which you may recall it being the traffic stack, which is now renamed the traffic safety form, we discuss the confidentiality at a particular collision or crash investigation. But that information is confidential and any information regarding the investigation at the time of the crash 
or any time after should be given to the Depart uh, DCPI, which is the Deputy Commissioner of Public Information, which will vet that information and actually disseminate it to the media as well as any of our social media platforms. Um, we are always looking for ways to do better. We understand that this particular situation can be traumatic, not only to the family, but only of what to the community. We understand that collisions are unpredictable, but they are preventable. And that's why we work with the Department of Transportation to determine uh, where these collisions occur and what can be done to make sure it doesn't happen again. Okay, it sounds like that was a very thorough and long answer no to my question, that you don't have a standing panel of crash victims advising you and giving you regular feedback on the process so that you could make it go better you know, over time for families. Okay, so um, I, I, I left out the fact that actually when I was assigned to this position, I met with families of safe streets um, and I also met with mothers of this drunk drunk drivers, uh, some of the advocates that were concerned about uh, the information as well as how to engage the families. And I will continue to have that relationship. And did you change things as a result of those meetings? As a result of those, the feedback that I received uh, came out, what came out of that was the actual bereavement guide that we are actually giving the families. In addition to that, so um, I'm sorry. In, in addition to that, uh, we still continue to have conversations with the DA's office to determine that if there's anything else that we need to do, we also um, would like to continue to have conversations uh, to make it better and to also um, make sure we bring closure to the family. Okay. I continue to hear from families a, a lot of dissatisfaction. So I think meeting with them again and making additional changes would be a good first step. Um, uh, and I appreciate your time today. I continue to strongly support this legislation because the goal here is a real focused and coordinated strategy to combat reckless driving. It shouldn't take you know, a crash where someone uh, you know, did not get taken off the streets after a hit and run, uh, ran all those red lights, and we had to take two years to pass a bill to have a strategy for combating and reducing the most reckless drivers in our city. The goal is to get that going. That's why I support this legislation. Uh, thank you, Chair, for all this time. Congressman, thank you. Can I, can I possibly add one other um, thing that we've done as far as meeting with uh, the families of Safe Street? We've created a video throughout the department, and that video is specifically geared to victim blaming. And that was based upon uh, the feedback from family of State Street. Okay, thank you. Let me let me interject with a uh, two or three questions before I continue with my colleague. Uh, and first of all, I want to clarify that looking at my own data, uh, uh, when I refer to the forty-four thousand uh, uh, for the benefit of your data, uh, uh, I was referring to heat and run. So it looked that the larger number that you're sharing is because they involve all these crashes, not only hit the run. Uh, but if we can look at it from those groups that we have in 20, uh, 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 in the last three years, 2019 and 2020, how many of those were hit and run? So I can provide you with data for 2020, the total number of cases that involve leaving the scene? Yes. Would be a 99. And that's, that, those are the ones that we refer to uh, collision investigation squad. No, in 2015, let me give you the sample. In 2015, we have 38,000 of heat and run. In the last few years, and commission also from DOT, because you as a DOT also work with those numbers together as a leading entity uh, of Vision Zero. How many, what is the last number that you have related to hit and run? Yeah. 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 
so I'll start with I'll start with 2019 and then I'll give you 2020. Is that okay? Okay. In 2019, the total number of leaving the scene collisions were 47,865. In 2020, the total number of leaving the scene collisions were 39,690. 690? Yes, sir. How many and on the 2019 and they were injured, personal injury? So in 2019, there were 6,782, which resulted in a physical injury. In 2020, there were 6,652 that resulted in a physical injury. Can you repeat that number, the last one? 6, the 2020? Sorry. 2020, that's 6,000. 652. Okay. And does the investigation, the collision investigation unit investigate all those cases that involve personal injury? No, sir. The collision investigation squad will investigate collisions that involve a serious injury likely to die, a critical injury, or a death where a person has left the scene. And, and who investigate the rest of the cases? The remaining cases will be referred to the detective squad as an open investigation. And who, and do you have the numbers of how many of those investigations outside the squad and they will drive it being arrested? No, we don't. But we can do. you share, can you, yeah, can we follow up with the phone? I'll follow up with you on that. Okay. And can you also go back on, on, on giving me what is the, when you look at a, the definition of a, a, that you have as critical injury, a patient as defined uh, from the NYPD and in, especially in this unit that is responsible to follow the investigation. It's, we, we didn't we didn't give that definition because it's not an NYPD definition. That's a determination made by EMS, the paramedics that respond to the scene, and then that triggers the response by CIS. So we that is not our definition. Uh, we defer to, to uh, EMS to to give you that definition. Okay. But in a letter in 2015 written by Commissioner Kelly. He established a critical injury patient will be defined as either receiving CPR in respiratory arrest or requiring and receiving life sustaining ventilator, circulator support. That was NYPD. That may be the EMS definition. Again, I have to I'll, after this hearing, I'll contact the MS. I'll see what their definition is. If you can forward me the letter from Commissioner Kelly from 2015, I'll tell you if it's the same definition. He may be quoting EMS. Okay. Uh, by the definition. Okay. And how many can you, can, can, I'm sorry, I know with the number, can you also go back and tell me the numbers on who made the investigation, the CIS? Say that again. Please. Can you repeat about the composition of the CIS, how many they are and who are they? The manpower you're talking about? Yes. That's uh, 22 detectives, five soldiers. 22? Yes. Okay. 22 detectives, five sergeants, one lieutenant. And, and also in the collision technician group, that, that's the group that also responds to uh, a, um, a CIS, a collision. Yeah, I, I just interesting to compare. Well, how are we doing? And of course, for me, what I'm leading toward doing my part to advocate for the unit to have more than what we have right now. So the, there, is a, there is a, again, in, in the same year in, 2017, sorry, in 2013, the CIS had 20, I'm sorry, 21 detectives, three police officers, and five supervisors. And the increase 
was as a result of the advocate, the council member making the case that we needed to add 10 additional detectives. So we're talking about, again, 2015. Here we are, 2021, as we are getting close to our budget, saying that similar numbers we have in those years is enough to investigate all those cases. I was, are you asking the question? Or? Asking the question, how can you justify that the number that you have right now to investigate those cases is enough for, for your case? I have a lot of, all of us are working different field. It's not a sense for someone in DOT that is responsible to, to pay for 200 a project as someone that say, I only had to work with 50. It's not the same one who's one who whoever is a lawyer uh, is working in the court system to say the same thing to work with all those cases that we have related to tenants. Hundreds compared they will only only will be working with few of them. It's not a sense for you to say that this number that I have right now, and to say that it doesn't matter if the number goes to 200, the outcome is be the will be the same of investigation. Well. Uh, council member, what, what we've testified to today repeatedly is that the number of CIS investigators assigned to CIS are sufficient to do good investigations, solid investigations based on the caseload they have today. We're not shortchanging any investigations. We're doing comprehensive, full investigations based on the cases that are presented to us. I look, <laughs> do the poll, check the family, see how we feel, pay attention to the testimony, and then we live with a consciousness. Okay. When it comes to, if, it, if it's enough, if it's enough, how, in, how we were able to increase 10 more detectives the last time that we got inscribed to the investigation, to the unit? Because you guys were saying that you had enough and we will push him for more. And here we are in the same place. You have dozen of cases going on. I think, and uh, then you're saying that it's enough to do the investigation and we have a major disagreement here. I, I mean, council member, we keep conflating this issue. So I think we've made our point on the record numerous times already. I, you know, I think the increase, the past increase in headcount, to your credit, to the advocate's credit, not taking away from that, uh, coincided with an increase with a, uh, unless I'm wrong, it, it coincided with a redefining of the parameters of what CIS investigates. Um, I think now we're talking about, is, this a, is the current headcount enough to do comprehensive investigations based on that criteria and the cases getting before CIS? The answer is yes, we are doing comprehensive investigations based on the cases that are getting to CIS. If you're talking about increasing or altering the criteria to increase the amount of cases that are gonna be investigated by CIS, then of course it would require a significant increase in headcount. I, I don't think we're saying different things. Yeah. What, what percentage of investigation, as again, if you can take me back, ended with driver being arrested? I think there's so, 70. 78. So in 2020, out of the 374 investigations by CIS, there were 78 arrests and 40 summonses. What is the percentage when you look at all those cases that you've been investigated? Like from those cases that you investigated last year, if you can compare 2019, what percentage ended with drivers being arrested? Okay, so in 2019, there were 349 CIS jobs, 110 arrests, which resulted in a 31% of the cases that were investigated 
resulted in the arrest. And, 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 that, and those are the numbers that we feel that by increasing the numbers of men and women in the CIS to have more time to investigate deeply those cases will be helpful to, to uh, increase that percent. We, uh, uh, which, Council member, again, we're, we're going to have to clear this record because what you're saying is that there is insufficient people in CIS today to do adequate investigations. We are disagreeing with that. You know, it's about probable cause to make an arrest. And we work closely with the district attorneys to present the evidence that CIS gathers and to determine whether or not probable cause exists to make an arrest. That is being done. No, we we have the total we have number of arrests. The total number of arrests is a consequence of whether or not there's enough probable cause to make the arrest. Not if you increase the number of investigators with the current caseload, right? If you don't change the current caseload and you increase the number of investigators, that's not going to get you probable cause. Yeah, probable but even cause even even time. today, even today. The investigation squad unit is mandated to investigate certain cases. And they the vast majority of injury that are not investigated by the coalition investigation squad unit. Right, so we, we from our role are saying two things. One, more men and women power should be given to the investigation regarding the state of the NYPD or if they go to DOT. Second, we should even in in, in, increase the numbers of cases, the criteria of people that should be investigated by the CIS. And this is our role as a council. You, as you know, you need to, you have the criteria of what is those cases that this unit investigate. We have a responsibility to be sure that we provide and we make any changes so that the numbers, the ratio of members of the unit and the numbers of people that are involved in, in critical condition, get more attention, get more time. And second, we do believe that we need to improve the universe, increase it, so that more people are included and designated for this unit to do the investigation. Thank you. Next person, please. Hey, Chair. Uh, next, we'll hear from Councilmember Holden, who has been patiently waiting, followed by Council Members Miller and Koo. Councilmember Holden. Uh, thank you, everyone, and uh, thank you to DOT and NYPD for uh, the testimony. Uh, two and a half hours into this hearing, and I have not heard anything that DOT says they have. They get along with NYPD. Have a good partnership. Uh, in, in these uh, collision investigation um, investigations. D and NYPD says they have a good rapport with DOT. Uh, I'm hearing we need more uh, detectives or investigators on this, which I would agree with. Um, but some of my colleagues are the same people that wanted to defund the police and cancel two academy classes. And they're now, they want more investigation. So it's, I'm a little puzzled by this whole hearing and this bill, this, uh, in my opinion, intro 2224 that we're hearing today is just another attack on NYPD and a giant waste of everyone's time. I don't, I, I haven't heard anything today that even remotely, yeah, okay, some of the, some of the accidents, don't, investigations don't turn out like some people want it to turn out. But there is the law, and if if our if council members or my colleagues want to change the regulations of, of people who are passing red lights and so forth and get them off the road, I'm all for that. Um, but I mean, it's a fact that that um, you know some crashes are criminal investigations, and police are the only ones qualified to investigate. We heard that today. Uh, there's a chain of custody of evidence. Uh, interrogating suspects, making arrests at the scene are all part of NYPD's jurisdiction. I, I fail to see, and if, and if DOT can, can tell me how 
anything under DOT would change. Uh, maybe a deputy commissioner can tell me if it was in the DOT jurisdiction, what would change? So I, so council member, your question is if DOT were to take on this function, what would we want to do differently than what NYPD is doing? Right. I can't say that I can identify something that we would want to do differently than NYPD. There you go. So, uh, you know, it's, it's unbelievable that we're listening to a bill that both, you know, DOT doesn't want it. DOT said it's working perfectly. NYPD said it's working per perfectly, but a few council members feel it's not because they're not getting the results that may be safer streets. So then come up with legislation uh, that would make our streets safer. And, and let's stop this constant attack on the police. Um, or let's get some academies, uh, police academies back and let's increase the, the size of the, uh, the collision investigation uh, team. But I, I'm just, I just I'm, a, I'm puzzled by this whole hearing, two and a half hours, and I don't think we got anywhere. And I, the only thing we've learned is that it's, the system seems to be working, but we, let's expand the police uh, investigation of the accidents, which I'm all for. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, colleague and, and council member. And, and since you've been listening for the two hour and a half, and I'm sorry that I've been even patient too, you heard that it, it, from the beginning I said that even if we maintain this investigation power to these men and women who are doing it right now, but coordinated closely with the DOT or transferred to the DOT, that's what I've been saying from the beginning. I also been saying from the beginning that I feel that the number has been, should be increased. Something that I, as you know, commissioner in the vision zero, I, I did my job increasing funding for DOT to other resources to do, the, to do the awareness campaign. Even though at some point the administration didn't take as a priority. Even when one the Melissa Marby Berito, we also work hard to improve and increase the numbers of men and women in the NYPD because we felt that we needed to keep our streets safe. So we have a record. And when it comes to this conversation about funding to the NYPD, as you know, even last year, some people wanted to, uh, some uh, individuals that I respect were advocating with the campaign defunded the NYPD. My position has been clear on continue supporting the NYPD with the resources that they need to keep our city safe. And when we talking about this particular piece, this is about a, again, reallocating detectives, which I think will be a better argument that we should have in this conversation together. So I think that, you know, everyone has to do their job. Everyone has to follow direction. Anyone has to justify where different area of the city is right now, we believe that there's a strong record there. And please stay listening, stay in this, in, 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 in this uh, 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 hearing when the family for safe street will testify. I know that you're always there or you leave someone staff that take the note, but stay in listening. You will get that most people being frustrated. Most people being waiting for years and years. And the DAs, I have a lot of respect to all of them. They, we should continue being working together with them to go to Albany, to get rid of the red tapes that we have in Albany that doesn't provide the DAs all the tools they want. Let's address how long does it take for the lab to come back with the result when they do the blood tests after investigation started in the scene. Sometimes you wait month for those results to come back. My expertise education, by my years here chairing this committee, working all of you guys, especially working with the family for Safe Street, I can tell you that my perspective has changed completely. And please, for the respect of everyone, don't come and justify that the number that we have today is enough. Don't come and justify that the work as it is right now is enough. Let's be open. Next council member, please. Uh, our next council member will be council member Miller who will be followed by council member Koo. Council member Miller. Okay, starts now. 
Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair, for, for, for that eloquent dissertation. I, I, I agree wholeheartedly um, and, 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 uh, but for a number of reasons. Um, we, we've heard a testimony from DOT as well as from the NYPD, and I, and I don't think that uh, for everyone, as, as Councilmember Holder said, uh, sees that they, they are on the same page. I don't believe that DOT believes that it has the capacity to do the type of work that is necessary to keep folks safe. And I would submit uh, that from my experience, and I know that you had reached out to the new commissioner and I had myself because um, in, in the community that I represent in Southeast Queens and, 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 and the broader community, uh, there's a real dissatisfaction with the DOT and how it delivers its services, right? It lacks equity and diversity in how it delivers its services, how people are kept safe. There are communities that the mines have had as many as um, uh, accidents, incidents regarding pedestrians, cyclists, as any other community, but we don't get the infrastructure and the capital investment that happens throughout the city. We get punitive red light cameras and that is it. And we don't get the en engagement and the type of dialogue that allows communities to really be engaged and, and, and be better. Now, that's one part of it. Um, as a, I, I may be the only trained uh, accident investigator in, in, in the council. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that in my other life, I've had the, the opportunity to work with um, the NYPD and the DOT in responding to uh, uh, accidents. I can attest to each qualifications and the partnership that is required in order to facilitate um, real accident investigations and, and that partnership occurs actually obviously I, I was the third party on the MTA side um, but it, it happens. Can we be better? We can absolutely be better but we need to invest in the areas uh, and in the agencies that can actually do the work. Should there be further collaboration? Absolutely but to put this onus and responsibility on an agency that has not demonstrated that they can provide the services equitably, uh, I, I think would be doing a disservice to all those in, involved. Uh, furthermore, uh, I, I think that there are clearly some state laws that would preclude some of the things that are happening that require uh, police investigation, require police responses, responses. Uh, to accidents and, and, and we could just be better. I will tell you that this summer, I, I have a nephew that was involved, uh, who, who was involved in a hit and run accident and, and he is now paralyzed. And, and that person uh, left the scene and was, there was a dispute as to who was driving and there was witnesses that was, came to the police and, and, and were able to testify to that. So, you know, Let's not reinvent the wheel, but, and then, and, and lastly, I, I, I want to say that there's a reason why the governor has this mandate on police reform. And a lot of that is because of the pain and agony endured by the Black, Latino, Asian community at the hands of police injustices. I am absolutely not diminishing any shape, form, or fashion the the trauma that families endure. But there are communities that have endured trauma at the hands of, of, of the NYPD and policing uh, throughout the state and throughout the country. Let's not lose our focus. Let's, re let's reform where we need to reform. This is a problem that should not be hard to fix, right? We have the tools. We have the resources. If we put all our collective partnerships behind this, we can do that. But let's not shift the focus from where it needs to be. I want to thank the chair. I want to thank all the, those who are going to come on and speak uh, to this issue. Um, in the future, those who, who testified in, in, in the past uh, will continue to support families, uh, will continue to work with all of those that, that have a vested interest. But I'll just say that we had we had a location in my district that had 17 accidents, 
And it wasn't until the 17th accident was a school bus that something was triggered at the DOT that we can get a four-way stop sign at that location. Not throw out the baby with the bathwater. Let's get better. I appreciate, Chair. And uh, I I'm committed to working with you on any uh, on getting better on this issue. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. Our next council member will be Council Member Ku. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez, and thank you, NYPD and uh, and NY um, Department of Transportation. Um, I think this legislation, the intention is good, but we have to be cautioned about the consequences. Now, we don't want to ask, you know, be careful. When the, you don't want to wish this law passed and the un devastating consequences. Let me give you an example, right? Um, the administration take away the police responsibility to enforce our homeless uh, uh, people. Now the whole street is full of homeless people. Now nobody's doing anything about it. And another thing is uh, the administration take away the police responsibility for enforcing an unlicensed vending um, in New York City. Now, if you come to Flushing, Every day is a sale and free market on the sidewalks, on busy sidewalks. And police not doing anything because they said the mayor told him don't do anything. And consumer of affairs not doing anything because consumer of affairs said the city council passed a law to create an office to regulate and enforce this unlicensed vending. But this office hasn't set up yet. And it takes time and it takes uh, money to set up an office. So I, I don't want the like, NYPD to stop doing accident investigations. I don't think Department of Transportation want to do it. They don't have the experience. They don't have the manpower, especially now we're in the pandemic. pandemic. We don't have the money to hire additional people. No, if you take away their responsibility, you will have devastating consequences here. And the accidents will take a long time to investigate. Of course, we all have like terrible accidents uh, in our districts. Uh, many years ago, we have a hit and one uh, with a, a family uh, the, and the, the guy got killed by hit and one and then he has a like, whole family to feed for. And, and, and the wife was really devastated. And, and the police at that time, uh, maybe they're not responding passionately you know, or, or no transparency. So, so the family was really angry that they didn't receive the proper attention. And these cases are happening everywhere. So my, 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 my take is that we hope the police will be more compassionate uh, to victims' families assign somebody that they can call or give them a number, a tracker number, or that there's always somebody to follow the case and give them the progress because I don't think they're doing it now. And then sometimes when you talk to detectives, it's very really hard to find them, you know? So my, my question is to the, to the police department, how do you increase transparency and, and be more compassionate? Uh, and how do you change the culture of NYPD so that they are, uh, they, they are more responding uh, to victims' complaints? You know? Because a lot of times the victims' families, they, they have a hard time to get the, to reach the, the, the police officer. They're in charge. And, and usually the police officers, they are not in charge. They don't know anything about it because everything, oh, they say, oh, it's a detective squad. So that's the end of the story. And the detective, detective squad don't respond to the in inquiries. So please, can you tell us on the, uh, in the future, can you tell us how to increase uh, uh, the morale and, and, and the culture of the police department so that they are more responding, uh, more compassionate and, um, uh, and, and responding to victims' families or inquiries uh, in a timely manner. 
Um, one of the things we spoke about uh, previously was training, uh, making uh, police officers uh, that respond to collisions, giving them the training to understand that information at the scene is confidential. Also, being able to engage and re reach out to the families that experience uh, a collision or a, a family member that's involved in a collision. So we've created this video that talks about victim blaming. Our expired. Oh, please finish the answer. <laughs> and the video has been circulated throughout the department. So every police officer on patrol uh, were obligated to review this video and give them in instructions on what victim blaming does, uh, why it hurts the victim, as well as why it hurts the representation or, or the, of our department. The other thing is that in our traffic safety forum, we talk about lessons learned and best practices, being transparent, speaking with not only just the community council, but also the build the block meetings about what's going on in the geographical area and how we can collaborate with the community to get us to, um, to get information so that if there's something going on in the community as it relates to traffic, that we're aware about it and we can address it. Uh, the other thing is that with, with all of these things that we're doing, people have to be responsible. So it's the responsibility and the, it's the accountability. And the way we look at that is the ex executive officer in the precinct is responsible for making sure that all of these uh, lessons learned as well as any uh, protocol that we put in place as it relates to engaging with the community, engaging with the victims, uh, providing confidential information. The executive officer in the, um, the relative precinct are aware of this and they are given instructions to the officers that are in the precinct. I just want to make a point that's very important. Uh, you know, we talked about injuries, and, and, and like I said, injuries actually not only have an effect on families, but they have an effect on our community. And it's very important that we work together with the Detective Bureau, who has a lot of these cases, to make sure that we are keeping in touch with the family members, to make sure that we're transparent to the community, to make sure that we're providing information as it relates to um, accidents or fatalities, I'm sorry, collisions or fatalities that happen in the community. And working with the Department of Transportation is very important because they are the experts in making sure the infrastructure is changed. And one other partner is very important, which is the district attorney's office. As we mentioned before, the law is the law. And we work closely with the district attorney to make sure that all of the investigation stations, as well as evidence that we collect at the scene is presented to the district attorney to determine if criminality is there where we can make an arrest. Um, also, we need to be able to have the community trust us to provide us with information. You know, this reckless driving uh, and behavior that's taken place since the pandemic is, we've seen it. We know that it is uh, in, in some of our community. We need to be able to have the community trust us to tell us where it is occurring. And we need enforcement as well as doubling down on education and um, also looking at infrastructure. So, so Chief, are you saying that police officer in the prison is responsible um, to inform the victim's family the progress of the case? Well, Which officer? The commanding officer or the, just the, the community officer? So I'll clarify that. As I mentioned before, every crash is investigated. A crash may happen where the two motorists are at the scene, there are no other factors, and that police officer is responsible for taking that information and communicating with the individuals that are involved or making the arrest if necessary. And then there are cases where an individual may be involved in a collision and that vehicle has left the scene. That particular investigation will be under the auspices of the detective bureau. 
And then there's the, there are the ones that will reach a collision investigation squad, which is if a person is seriously injured, likely to die, or critically injured, or dead. And that's when a collision investigation squad will reach out to that particular victim or family. Thank you. Yeah, it's critical that the police handle this uh, in the proper way. Because when a family member die or disabled, it's not only a statistic. No, it's the whole family suffering. No, nobody is feeding the family. They don't. They lost their whole uh, family income. So it's really emotional and traumatized. So I hope you guys uh, can do a, a, a do a better job uh, to communicate with the family. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Chair, I believe Councilmember Levin has a quick follow-up. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I um, just want to, to, uh, to read this into the record because I had asked about this before. Um, so in I, the data I have um, uh, is from 2011. So 2011, there were 304 AIS deployments 241 resulted in death, 63 likely to die. Um, so uh, there's been a marginal increase um, from, in, uh, from that time. And the, the change being that it did now includes um, critical cases. So it's what's the, what was last year's deployments? You said Three, 345, was that right? Three, it's 374, but there's a, you know, just one, one point. You're correct that there's been a change of the criteria that triggers CIS since 2011, but there's also been a significant decrease in crash fatality since 2011. So the universe expanded, but the thankfully the individuals that fall within the universe uh, contracted. How many how many crash fatalities were there in 20 last year? Uh, 245. 225, so it went from 241 to 245. 245. 245. Okay, there was 241 in 2011. So that's actually an increase. Right. Well, there's critical injuries. That accounts for the other 128. Right, right. So, so, uh, so then 63 likely to die in 2011. So, so that's obviously that's an increase. I'm just uh, it's, I'll it's verify not... the 2011 number because that seems a little low to us, but I'll verify that and circle back. Okay. This came from a resolution that I, I actually sub, uh, sponsored in 2012 um, that cited that. So if you go back and look at the resolution, that number came from, I believe, NYPD when we did the resolution. Well, we'll check the crash data and get back to you. It sounds a little low, but we'll follow up with you. Uh -huh. and give you what we've done. I, right. I just, I just want to be clear, I mean, it was, um, it, there's, there was 4,000 cases of serious injury resulting from crashes last year, in, 20, in 2019, right? Or injury that is, that was serious injuries. I'm sorry, what was the number of serious injuries resulting in crashes? Yeah, quickly, 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 yeah, we try. So that's not a category we track. We track injury, critical injury, and death. Serious injury is nothing not in between injury and critical injury. So you have thirty-six thousand. Is that right? How many? How many? How many injuries? Total injury. Twenty twenty, it was forty-four thousand thirty. Right. Uh, right. So, I mean, the issue here is that, and Councilmember Lander spoke to this, is that you've got nothing between 24,000 and 374. There's nothing in between that because you either have your injury um, criteria or your critical injury criteria, and there's nothing in between. And so. That's not uh, right, Council Member. That's, that's, that's not, not right. No. Because you, you're. The criteria that we're talking about is yeah. what triggers CIS. What you're leaving out is the detective squad. So there's not that there is something in between. There's detectives investigating 
the cases that don't rise to CIS jobs. Right, but what I'm saying is that if you don't, I mean, I'm talking about criteria here. If you have, you have, you just said you have injury, and then your next step up from injury is critical injury, and then your next step up from that is serious likely to die. The next step up from that is death. So you, you don't have any, you don't have anything between injury and critical injury. And if you've got 24,000 injuries and 374 critical injuries or critical and above, that's a, I mean, obviously that's a huge difference. So if you're only, basically what you're saying, what what what's happening is you're, you're investigating, uh, uh, what is that? One uh, or 2% of injury cases. CIS is not you. I mean, I, 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 um, I respect the fact that the detective squad is doing investigations, but CIS is investigating one or two percent of of car crashes that involve an injury. One or two percent. That's it. It's, it's three forty-five out of twenty-four thousand. What is that? That's, that's uh, so. So that that's not a very high percentage. So the question is, you know, I'm not. No, I don't think anyone's saying that the CIS needs to investigate all twenty-four thousand cases that result in injury. But there's a big difference between, you know, one or two percent and a hundred percent. And so, you understand? If, I mean, I I understand what you guys are saying that it's that detectives take care of the vast majority of these cases. But obviously, um, you know, I think that. The level of training and expertise with CIS could be put to good use, investigating a broader universe of cases that involve some level of serious injury in between critical and any injury at all. Right, and that's and to to that point, that's why the highway district trained 140, 43, or 145. Uh, police officers in the evidence collection teams on measurements, on photographing scenes. They're already trained. So Again. when you're talking about the universe of, we don't categorize it as serious injuries, but we certainly, there are layers within injuries and the ECT teams are activated within those layers as well. So there is Understood. a graduated process as well. Okay. Uh, I would I would urge you to go back and look at those 20, 2011 numbers because uh, it'll show that the number of, of um, the numbers are, are actually pretty uh, pretty consistent. Actually. So, um, but okay, I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember. Uh, our next Councilmember will be Councilmember Yeager. Councilmember Yeager. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. This uh, first question is to the police department. Are there any car crashes that are not investigated by the police if the police are notified? The only category that would um, actually apply to is property damage only. All right. So, um, and then obviously there are the categories of, uh, of death, serious injury, uh, critical injury, um, where where the CIS team is brought in, and mm -hmm. in are there any categories of that that fit that criteria that CIS is not able to investigate because okay. of a lack of resources? Every category, uh, which is serious injury likely to die, critical or death, uh, CIS is notified, and CIS will investigate every one of those. Um, issue, uh, collisions. And do you have the resources right now in that division to investigate all the uh, all the crashes that fall into those categories? We have detectives that are assigned to the squad, and they are responsible for investigating uh, the 374 uh, collisions that we had this year. Thank you. My next uh, set of questions is for the Department of Transportation. If a community board and a council, sorry, Is that a, okay. If a community board and a council member send a letter to the Department of Transportation saying there's a public school on a block and we believe that a speed bump ought to be installed, 
how long does it take for that speed bump to show up and be installed? So our first step is obviously to um, do an investigation at that location. We'll take, we'll look at the crash history. We'll look at the speeds at the location. I won't, um, I'll be very honest with you, council member. We have a long backlog of speed hump requests, so we don't get to them very quickly. Um, so it could be a number of months before we respond back if we believe a speed hump is warranted or not. Okay, so first you have to look and see if one, if you believe one is warranted. Correct. And should you determine, and should you determine that one is warranted, then working backwards from the time that the initial inquiry request was made, how long would it take? It would definitely be a number of months. Is it true that right now the department is not doing traffic studies in response to requests for traffic signals at locations? We have resumed doing traffic studies um, in late fall, we resumed them. Um, if, if it is a traffic study directly adjacent to a school or on a school block, we are not doing them because obviously schools are not in full swing. So it won't be representative of the typical traffic that we would normally see. So those are still on hold, but by and large our traffic analysis has continued. Okay, well, I'll get to the, I'll get to the part about the full swing in a second, but um, uh, how long were they suspended? How long were you not doing traffic studies? They were suspended roughly from March to November. Um, if, a, if a council member and a community board send a request to the department about a particular intersection that they believe warrants a traffic signal of some kind, either a light or a sign, how long does it take for the light or the sign to arrive? Okay, it's similar to the speed hump answer. First, we need to uh, investigate it and determine if it's, a, if it's necessary. So that work um, can take place between four and six months. And then if it's a stop sign, obviously that's very simple to put up. That would happen very quickly. If it were a traffic signal that requires um, trenching and installation of infrastructure, and that would take longer to put out on the street. Longer is not a period of time. Longer is just the, the characterization of a period of time. How long would it take once you determine that the council member and the community board were right, working backwards from the time that the initial request was made, so now you have four to six months for a study to be done. In my experience, by the way, we're being told in Brooklyn that it takes no, lo no less than eight months, but let's say four to six months is the right answer. How long does it take after that six-month period for the light to show up? It generally takes about three months after. So we're talking about nine to 10 months for a light to show up from the time that the request is made. If it's warranted, correct. If it's, if it's warranted, okay. All right. Um, these, these series, and I, and I just wanna, I wanna reflect that before I, before I go into just making a statement, these series of questions are, are not in the, thank you, Sergeant. Um, I'm, I'm certain that the chair is gonna give me the same time that was allotted to other members on this topic. Um, I'm, I'm glad to see that the department is in agreement with the police department uh, on, on the issue of where the investigations for, for, uh, for traffic crashes, for fatalities, particularly for places where there may be criminal investigations involved should remain. And that's with the police department. <laughs> what I'm fascinated, and Commissioner, this is not for you, I know the last person I spoke with here, but this is just in general, um, the notion that, that uh, a simultaneous notion that number one is we have too many cops and also, by the way, we don't have enough cops. Um, the notion that uh, the police department is simultaneously A, not doing enough and B, doing too much. There were questions earlier today uh, uh, about uh, whether or not, uh, what, what the percentage of crashes that resulted in arrests are. A department that has been accused in this body of not affording proper due process is also at the same time expected to have 100% of its cases of, of crashes result in an arrest, notwithstanding the notion of due process. And I assume that the district attorneys who are all here and who agree uh, with my opposition to this bill uh, will we'll talk about. Um, there is an investigation. There's a question of whether or not uh, there is probable cause to make an arrest. Just because a very bad guy got behind the wheel of a car and did a very bad thing and cost people's lives 
doesn't necessarily mean that an investigation will result in an arrest. But the police department is being accused of not doing enough because it didn't hit 100% arrest in every time a, cra a car touches a person. Now, I believe that if somebody, this is not a question, this is a statement. I believe that if somebody gets behind the wheel of a car and acts recklessly and causes death, serious injury, property damage, hurts somebody, has broken the law, they ought to be arrested, they ought to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. So this question to the commissioner, uh, to the Department of Transportation, do you have arrest powers? No, we do not. Do you have the power to swear out a complaint and file it with the criminal court and uh, or justice uh, and seek a search warrant? No, we don't. Do you have the power to seek an arrest warrant? No. If an arrest warrant or a search warrant were issued by a court, do you have the power to effectuate the arrest or the search? No, we don't. If your, if your department were to show up at the scene of a crash and were to find that, uh, that there was a crime scene uh, or, that there was a, or that an investigation was necessary to determine if a crime was made, do you have the power, the legal power to bar people from that area? to secure the scene. There, there are the thing you're describing generally goes along with the law enforcement entity. We don't secure scenes, criminal okay. scenes. So if somebody, if somebody from the Department of Transportation said, don't go here, there was a crash and we're securing the scene. And I said, hey pal, you don't tell me what to do. And I keep walking. Can he arrest me? Right, for your line of questioning, really, I don't have comment on these items. Well, you, 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 do, you can comment to the extent whether or not your department has the ability to make an arrest. We don't make and arrests, correct. No, sir, not that you don't, but you don't have the legal authority to do so. That's correct. Council, this city council, the city of New York cannot give you that legal authority. Is that correct? Because you're not peace officers. Um, we, my understanding no, is that my understanding is that the between the state and, right, there are state implications as well as city charter implications. All right. So I'm, thank I'm you. gonna wrap this up. Yes, Mr. Chair, thank you. I'm gonna wrap up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I appreciate the chair giving me uh, close to as much time as he's given to others. And I'm, I'm gonna wrap up for now and turn it back over. I'm sure there will be other witnesses who will come in. I look forward to hearing from the district attorneys who have the ultimate responsibility to bring these cases to trial um, about whether or not they want to entrust uh, this kind of work to the police, to the law enforcement, or to the Department of Transportation. And I'm excited to hear that. I too have been here for as long as Councilman Holden, uh, waiting to learn more about this bill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilman. But you are describing something that is not accurate. Uh, 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 first of all, Commissioner, I think that some of those answers are not neither accurate because I feel that the conversation that we're having right now is not about DOT to have the power to investigate. It's not for DOT now to have the power that the state is the one that mandate. I even say at the beginning in my opening statement that one of the way of how it can work is for the unit to continue doing their job, to continue having the men and women that they have in the in that unit, yes, be as some finding the way of how it should be coordinated and be under the DOT. The pieces, the ingredient, how can they happen? I feel this is about city hall and the council to go over and see how we can come out with a common agreement. Mm -hmm. But I feel that this is not a scenario to come and create a situation that definitely will involve in a completely opposite way on how we see things. I think that, in, 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 first of all, all those questions about who had the power to investigate, from the beginning we know. And look at the bill. It described in a way that the NYPD will continue having the investigation role. Read the bill. Second, when we look on the resources to the NYPD, if the person is leading this conversation, my case as a co-prime together with my colleague, I, the one who advocated 
before this caution conversation, some people to call him to defund the NYPD, call him to double this unit. So council member, it's not that we are saying we need to find a way of how the NYPD should save money and not being able to identify area that we need to add, the headcount. I've been advocating for that for many years and I maintain my level of advocacy, asking for this unit to be double. It doesn't matter if it stays as it is. It doesn't matter if the unit continue having the person in charge right now and get and be coordinated with the, with the, with the, with the, with the, with the New York City Department of Transportation. So I, I just thought that we continue this conversation as it is described. This bill, this intention, include the NYPD continue their role to do the investigation. And, 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 and uh, uh, let me go back to the new commissioner or the, NY, the chief of the NYPD, because I think it's important to uh, put some and clarity of this number. So last year, based on, and correct, again, let me just put in your word. How many crashes did we have in 2020? The number of collisions that we had was 111, 779. Okay. How many, how many of those ended with people being with injuries? Of that 11, 1100, of that 1100,000, 44,030 re resulted in injuries. Injury. And, and how many from the 44,000 ended with in critical injuries? 128. 128. And the number of cases that the CIS investigated last year, how many were there? 374 cases were investigated by CIS. 74. And then the rest of those That's involving three. injuries are were investigated under the Detective Bureau. That's what we got from you guys, right? Could you repeat that, sir? If the rest of, from those 44,300 injuries that happened last year in 2020, you just say that the CIA has investigated 374. Did the rest of those cases were investigated by the Bureau, by the detective bureaus? No. It, it they would either be investigated by patrol or the detective bureau. Who lead that? Who lead that? Who centralized that piece? Who can, Who is? Who is the person in, in charge right now to do continue investigation on the patrol or under the detective bureau? So you're talking about two different bureaus. Patrol would be under the patrol services bureau, and that would be the officer responding to the scene of a collision. Okay. And then the precinct detective squad would be under the detective bureau that is responsible for all the detectives in the but does it make sense doesn't it make sense again regardless where the unit will land it and and as i say i know i know about increasing the effectiveness and supporting and asking to support to double the men and women in this unit i'm calling for that today as i called three or four years ago that's my record so don't you think that it makes sense that the detective or patrol who are also following investigation related to injuries that are related to crashes should also be coordinated with this unit? Um, not necessarily, sir. Um, you're talking about um, investigators, as I mentioned before, that are very skillful and talented in uh, conducting an investigation as well as the crime scene and also working with the district attorney's office where an officer responds to a crash or a collision and there's an injury. Uh, these cases don't necessarily rise to the level of a investigation that will be presented to the district attorney's office. Now- I, I understand it. I think council member, I think what you're trying to say is 
should these other, should a crash that results in injury be coordinated under CIS? And the answer is no, because it's coordinated as part of traffic stat where the precinct command, uh, precinct executive officer has to appear once a week, uh, it's once a week still, right? Once a week. And these sorts of investigations and these sorts of collisions are spoken about. So yes, it is coordinated. It's just not coordinated by CIS, nor should it be coordinated by CIS. CIS is part of the traffic stat, and there, and that's that's the umbrella under which everything is coordinated. I, I understand. I understand. I understand your your point. But I'm looking at if there were 44. Injured 44,000 injuries as a result of crashes last year, and 374 were investigated by the coalition because of the responsibility uh, that we give to them. We're talking about that there were more than 43,000 cases that involved injuries. And then I can ask you the question right now how many people were arrested from those 43,000? Again, council member, I, we said this earlier on. I mean, that's not a number that we have. How many people were arrested by patrol, by detective bureau? We have the number of cases that got to CIS and how many arrests were made out of that universe. I can follow up with you after the hearing as I promised, and we can talk about how much enforcement was taken in those other cases, whether it was summonses or arrests or, or it didn't rise to the level of criminality or enforcement. Yeah, and, and I just want to be sure that we, and I know, I know that is in our heart of commitment and we work 24 seven, you know, to make our streets safe. And as you know, I always have all my respect to the work of the, the chief that with the, the great chief that we are right now, the previous one, the commissioner, everyone again involved, uh, DOT and you guys for the NYPD. So, but you, we also have to look at the epidemic that we're dealing with. And no, we are not looking for a hundred percent of the cases to be ended. We we arrest. No one has said that. What we are saying is, how can we create? How can we increase that number? And how can we figure out a different way or how we can reform? It? And and I know it, it it marries to one only way of how we can end to that goal. However, I feel that with few months in this administration where we make vision zero a top priority, I hope that this administration will end it well when it came to getting close to our goal of, 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 of making, bringing to zero the number of people who are dying because of crashes. I know that that's a goal. I know, I'm not expecting that, that we will be able to say, you know, from here to there, can we, get, can we go to zero? But this is an epidemic. And I feel again that, you know, centralizing those information uh, is important. And, and of course, looking for opportunity on how we always can think in different way or how we can coordinate it. So I had never expected that this unit that has investigation will not be composed of men and women that are trained, that are in the law enforcement, the question right now is how does unit can be coordinated? And in this case, we do believe that if it's under DOT or coordinated close to DOT, we can increase the level of effectiveness. And we also, we believe that all those cases that, that doesn't get the, the attention because no one has died, should also be a top priority to be investigated to. I think that the council member, it has a follow-up question. Council member? We can go to Council Member Yeager first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, first of all, I, I would like to join uh, you in, in your advocacy to double the size of this unit. I'd like to triple it, and I'm fine with that. Uh, and if that's, if that's the position you're stating, I'm happy to advocate for that. The point of my question about the size of the unit and, uh, and the line of questions indicating uh, or asking the department whether or not they were satisfied that they had the right number of personnel was simply because when we have departments in the city, uh, it, it seems to me, I'm, I'm just not familiar with any department in, or any unit in any department anywhere where we are legislating uh, the size of the department, the size of the unit in any way. So if the, if the position is that we ought to 
uh, double or triple the size of that unit, I'm okay with that. And, and I'm happy to advocate for that alongside you, Chair. Um, but what I would also point out on this bill, and, and Chair, as you know, I, I do read the bills here, um, and I know, I know you do as well. Um, this particular bill requires that the new unit to be created in the Department of Transportation will have the primary responsibility for doing the investigation. And one of the lines in there that, uh, that, that concerns me the most is it's, obligate, it's, it's re the requirement that it uh, the inspect the crash sites. I'm okay with that. Document vehicle and party positions. Maybe that makes sense. Measuring and collecting data, sure they're good at that. Um, but preserving evidence, interviewing witnesses, uh, conducting collision reconstructions, these are primarily law enforcement uh, tactics designed to build a case, designed to document and, and build a case that it can turn over to the district attorney for prosecution. And that's the ultimate goal, I think, Chair, and I'm sure that you agree with me. Uh, if we have criminality involved in a crash, you and I, I think, want to see the perpetrators prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. And we want to make sure that the, that the investigation that leads to that place is done by the experts. And at least I'm not going to speak for you, Chair, but at least that's my position. And I do thank you again for allowing me to clarify. Thank, thank, thank you. you. And, and, and we will follow. I will follow with your conversation. I think one of, one, of, one of my priorities right now is to be sure also that we look at everything that, that, that it takes to continue making our streets safe. And, and for me, this is about how we make any changes without putting, you know, in jeopardy when it comes the worry that the men and women or the NYPD has to do to keep us safe, including that piece related to the level of investigation. So I think that's some level, and I know Commissioner uh, and Margaret F. Johnny, you know, that a lot of respect. We have done a lot of work together. So, and, and I feel that the most important is for us to continue also been opening this conversation and trying to figure out a way on how it, we address the work that we have to continue doing it to improve safety. Because I know that you agree with me too that we are dealing with this epidemic. Coronavirus will be under control most likely in 21, hopefully. But I feel that this epidemic of crashes, hit and run, as we were here from the DA, is something that even as we can hear different position from there and a different opinion of the bill, but they also know that they need more from the state in order to be able to prosecute those criminal drivers who leave the scene after they get involved in a crisis. So again, more than happy to continue working with it. So I think that uh, Council Member Holden, you also have a follow-up question? Yes, thank you, Chair, for the uh, follow-up. I just want to make a point because again, this, this uh, bill, that we're talking about today creates a, a new unit, investigative unit, and I read the bill, and it is DOT doesn't want this. Uh, DOT can't handle this, and I think then the bill should have directed NYPD to investigate more crashes, probably you know compel the uh, change the criteria, compel the NYPD to lower the standards to investigate. If that's what uh, I'm hearing today, it, I'd agree with that. If you, you know, if, if, the, if you increase the staff on the NYPD, which many of my colleagues voted to eliminate, to actually defund the police or unfund. So I, that, that's, the, that's the problem I have here. Um, and be careful what you ask for, Chair, because I'm, I waited over three years, not months, three years for speed bumps in Woodhaven that experienced so many accidents. And I just kept getting it pushed back and pushed back. And there are dozens of, of accidents on that, on that block, yet three over three years. When I was campaigning, I put in for speed bumps. It went through the community board and I just got them installed recently. So be careful what you ask for. DOT is overwhelmed. And if we want to, you know, put the money in the right place, that the unit has been doing this for years, but we want to train, change the criteria, let's do that. But this bill is ill-advised, wrong, and it needed to be, you know, obviously some negotiations needed here before this bill was written and, and uh, submitted. But I just think it's um, ill-advised. And I, again, I'm just frustrated with the amount of time we spent talking about and going around in circles. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you, Council Member. And again, we will follow conversation. Man. And and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna repeat what I have say about my approach. And again, even when the mayor and the commissioner a few years ago say that they didn't need more men and women than what they did, we say that we did need it and we add it. And even you know, in the whole conversation on the, the great work that we've been doing criminal justice reform, I'm very clear in my position that we can find a way of how to continue improving the relationship between the police and the community. As the Brooklyn Board President Eric Ara has said, there's a lot of uh, assignment that we have made to many women they want to be inside the prisons and other area that most likely that those jobs can be being do, they can be done by the civilians and probably those men and women can be uh, reallocating other areas that we can fight crimes and make the streets safer. So. Again, I know that this is only a hearing and an opportunity for all of us to ventilate. And at the end of the day, Department Coming Express was City Hall what? And that's mm -hmm. a job of whoever is in, in leading any department. And this is a conversation that I hope that, you know, led by Speaker Johnson and Major De Palacio and all of us, we can end it in a place where, you know, we can come out again, identifying the best way of how they investigation squad unit, the detective bureau, the patrol, whoever are investigating these cases, we definitely need to think outside the boxes because the numbers that we have in front of us right now are not the best. So with that, uh, Commissioner and Chief, you'd like to say a few words before you know, closing so that uh, we will let you go and go to the public. Okay, just wanna say thank you very much, Chair, and we look forward to continuing our good work with you on Vision Zero and, and talking through all of this more. Thank you for thank your you. leadership. Thank you for your words. I agree, thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak to the council today in regards to this very important issue. And my heart goes out to the families, uh, the victims, and we look forward to working with the Department of transportation, as well as collaborating with other internal uh, units within the department to do better as we look to investigate these cases. Thank you. And, and again, that's a case that since happened in the borough of Brooklyn, we also being in conversation with the Brooklyn Board President Eric Adams and my colleagues there. And we, I will follow with you guys after this hearing to see, you know, what is the investigate, how is, how is the investigation going in the hidden run as a father or two daughters. And I know that commissioner also you have your, your two. Is, is we care for everyone, but especially when there's a child involved, I know that you break a heart. So uh, hopefully, you know, we will see results from this investigation. Thank you. And now we go to the public. Thank you, Chair. Uh, we will next turn to the district attorneys that are here to testify, followed by the rest of the general public testimony. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given two minutes to speak unless otherwise instructed by the chair. Uh, council members who have questions for a panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom and I or the chair will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you. Please wait for the sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Our first panelist will be the district attorney for Richmond County, Michael McMahon, who will be followed by the district attorney for Queens County, Melinda Katz. Uh, sergeants at the chair's discretion will allow the elected officials time to finish their testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and to the members of the committee uh, and to uh, our colleagues in the police department and DOT, and of course the members of the public who are so interested in this topic. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you this afternoon uh, on this bill and on this issue. Um, I am speaking as the Richmond County District Attorney. I know my colleague Melinda Katz uh, from Queens will follow me. Um, and um, I, I, I wanna just say to you all that I, I appreciate that you like everyone in my office are so concerned about uh, public safety and keeping the road safe uh, for uh, our fellow New Yorkers and in our case, our fellow Staten Islanders. And I share this goal with you as well as my, my main role as DA is to keep the people 
of my borough safe and to uh, uh, prosecute crime when it occurs uh, and to do everything I can uh, in my power and working with you as partners uh, to prevent crime. Uh, and I commend this committee in particular uh, for its commitment to public safety as seen through uh, the failure to uh, yield law, the vision zero laws that were passed and the work that you're doing on reckless driver accountability uh, as well. So I wanna to speak to you briefly as a district attorney. I speak, will speak to you also as a former civil litigator uh, who worked a lot on uh, automobile crash reconstruction cases. Um, and then I also wanna speak as a former member of the city council and in particular uh, this committee. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've heard what you've said this morning and, and I'm impressed by your compassion and, and knowledge, but uh, the truth remains that before this committee right now is a piece of legislation that I, uh, as well as the other DAs, and, and, and the, it's taken the form of a letter that we've submitted to the committee, strongly oppose this bill uh, because its language is very clear that quite simply it would yank primary investigative responsibility for uh, critical crashes from the police department and give it to DOT. Now, I know that uh, you've heard uh, at length uh, this morning uh, reasons uh, that that is a bad idea, uh, I want to state uh, without state unequivocally that it's a terrible idea. Uh, and I'll just summarize briefly why I think that's so. And I know my colleagues uh, feel the same way. As you've heard this morning, uh, the, investig the handling of uh, serious uh, crashes uh, where someone's life is uh, either taken or uh, may be taken uh, is something that requires an incredible amount of expertise. Uh, I'm joined this uh, afternoon by uh, Frank Prospero, who is a seven or eight year associate uh, uh, district attorney, assistant uh, district attorney in our office, who heads up our uh, vehicular crimes unit. Um, and he responds to just about every uh, type of uh, crash that we've been talking about uh, today himself uh, or uh, another executive in this office. And so he has a wealth of knowledge about how these cases are handled both by the police department and then by this office. And this is a very specific knowledge, one that the rest of the people in this office really don't have. It's taken him seven years to acquire this knowledge. You've heard how police uh, officers with, uh, uh, with now uh, CIS spent 10 years uh, on highways and, and the amount of training they've had uh, is enormous. Um, and they have that expertise because of the critical situations that they're called in to, to handle. As you've heard, they have to secure the crime scene. They have to uh, secure evidence. They have to uh, in invest, uh, interview witnesses. They have to take measurements, accident reconstruction. In many cases, someone has fled the scene and they have to pursue those individuals or coordinate that with the police department. Uh, sometimes those pursuits cross uh, county lines and state lines as well. It's a highly specific, highly technical, uh, and highly uh, essential work that they do. And to think that you can yank that uh, mission from the police department and drop it with the Department of Transportation, uh, sir, although your goals are laudable, is, as I said, a very bad idea. Uh, and so I, I, I echo the sentiments of my fellow DAs, as well as uh, the DOT and the police department, and even some of your fellow uh, council members who have pointed out uh, that in terms of criminal investigation and criminal prosecution, it would create an impossible situation and really have the opposite effect of what it is you guys, what you and the uh, co-sponsors want to um, uh, um, attain, obtain with this bill. So I urge you to reconsider it, withdraw this bill, and, and, and then go after the very laudable goals that you've spoken to in different ways. And so let me just speak briefly as someone who worked on uh, crash cases as a civil litigator, who have been to many scenes and worked with accident reconstructionists. You are right in having compassionate, compassion and concern uh, for the victims of uh, crashes. Uh, they are innocent. It is the result of negligence or criminal activity of others uh, that they suffer uh, uh, injuries that they should not be suffering. Uh, damages to their lives, uh, a change in probably their lives forever. Um, and that's something that we should all strive to eliminate. 
Um, but I have to, and, and I also want to say that as DA in our office, every victim of a crime, including vehicular crimes, is immediately connected with a victim advocate who works with them and their families uh, to help them get through the tragedy that they've suffered. Uh, but the, th the truth is, Mr. Chairman, not every collision that results in injury results in a criminal investigation or prosecution because a large number of those are deemed to be the result of negligence, a civil obligation or a civil wrong, if you will, that doesn't reach the level of criminality and therefore we do not connect with the victims of those cases. Uh, so I think you're right in asking the police department about how they could create a victim advocacy unit to deal with the individuals who are the victims of crashes but maybe not the victim of, of crime. And I'd be glad to consult with you uh, and work with you on that very uh, laudable goal. Now, I also want to speak to you lastly as a former member of this noble uh, uh, committee, because I see that what you're trying to accomplish is, as I said, a very laudable goal, which is to increase the breadth and scope of the work that accident investigation, um, I'm an old guy too, that the collision investigation uh, squad does um, and to increase their bandwidth. Uh, but yanking them out of uh, the police department is a bad idea. And, and think about it. If you were running the Department of Health and you had certain policies that you wanted to implement on behalf of the city of New York, you wouldn't go into a hospital and yank the, the surgeons out of surgery or the emergency room doctors out of the emergency room. You would work with them and try to uh, have them implement the policies that you see laudable, but you would not eliminate them or tell them that you're going to have somebody else do the surgery who's not trained to do surgery. And I know that you're an educator, sir, and I know that you've been in the classroom. And at the same time, you oversee the Department of Education and you work with them to implement policies that will better serve the children. But you would not go into the classroom and yank a teacher out of the classroom uh, and put a bureaucrat in there to do, uh, not that DOT is bureaucrats, excuse me for that, but people who are not trained to do that work to now do that work. What you would do is focus your efforts on the classroom. You would focus your efforts in the, in the uh, surgery theater or in the emergency room. And you would say, let's, let's bring more resources. Let's get more data. Uh, let's collect more data. And let's see what we can do to better serve the victims of, of uh, collisions uh, to prevent collisions. Uh, and, and I think that that's what you need to do here. So I urge you to withdraw this bill uh, and yet proceed uh, after this very important goal. And I have one final point because Councilman Lander uh, spoke about uh, justice and accountability and he also spoke about prevention. And that's what you're trying to achieve here. You're trying to bring justice to the victims and accountability to those who uh, commit uh, vehicular crimes, right? Um, that is a law enforcement function. Uh, our partners in the police department have the uh, obligation to investigate these crimes and to make arrests when uh, appropriate. And as you heard, uh, as awfully stated by Council Member Yeager, when there's probable cause, arrest is made, and then we, it's brought to us, and we hold the people accountable. Uh, we protect the rights of the victims. At the same time, we're aware of the constitutional rights of the accused. That's what we do. Prevention is primarily the role of the Department of Transportation, but to mix the two, to take that civil obligation and goal away, uh, or, or to mix that with uh, what happens uh, when it comes to justice and accountability, uh, that would be a big mistake and I think would be uh, deleterious to the overall initiatives that you have spoken so uh, eloquently about uh, this morning. So uh, I, again, am thankful for the time to be with you. Uh, and uh, I will now, uh, if I may, uh, yield uh, the rest of my time uh, to my colleague from Queens, uh, Melinda Katz, and I will also be available for any questions that any of you may have. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you to the council members for your public service and to all of you uh, for the work you're doing on this important issue. Thank you. Thank you, Honor. Thank you for your testimony. Do uh, any council members have questions for this particular witness? Council uh, members? Elio, why, why don't we uh, uh, finish listening to all of them? And then if anyone has any questions, then since they're gonna be still in the panel, so we address it. 
Sure. Okay. Our uh, next panelist will be uh, the district attorney for Queens County, Melinda Katz. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you uh, to my colleagues that are on this call uh, in law enforcement. Thank you very much for having this hearing. Uh, look, you know, as someone who has been, and I don't want to go into a personal history, but many of you know my history, as someone who has been personally affected by collisions in their life, and I know the turns that a collision can take into someone's world, I know the effect it has on the families, I know how the victims are feeling and the helplessness that they sometimes feel. It is the reason in my office we have increased the penalties for DWI. It's the reason I've not made it a secret that when drivers drive with suspended licenses because of DWIs or because of tickets or because of the dangerousness in which they drive, I believe that the penalty should be enhanced. But I wanna be very clear as a former legislator myself, as uh, DA McMahon said, you know, we're here to talk about a particular piece of legislation. This piece of legislation, from what I understand of reading it, I also read the bills, um, transfers primary responsibility to a crime scene that has critical injuries to DOT. And it not only transfers them to have the primary responsibility, it transfers the responsibility for press releases and for coordination and all that comes with being the primary investigator. But the fact is, you know, council members, everybody's talking about making the streets safer. And I'm not sure why they're mutually exclusive of one another. You can certainly have coordination with DOT and still keep the experts, those that are trained, those that know how to handle a crime scene, be the primary investigators. Since I took office a year ago, we've worked hand in hand with highly trained uh, CIS squads at over 90 collision scenes involving deaths. Assistant district attorneys assigned to my homicide bureau are on call 24 hours, seven days a week. If there is a homicide, I have an ADA that goes to the scene. And these collisions where pedestrians, cyclists, motorists are all killed or deemed likely to die. That's why CIS has them because the critical injuries that they have either make the victims deemed likely to die or they die. These assistants are specifically trained in the investigation and the potential prosecutions that arise at these scenes. And be very clear that in investigating and prosecuting these cases, we rely on the expertise of CIS. CIS not only has the responsibility to investigate these crash scenes, but the unique skill set to do so. They are knowledgeable about advancing vehicular technology. And by the way, they're the ones that are going to be called in grand juries and in trials to testify about what happened at that scene. In addition to their specialized knowledge, CIS detectives as police officers are specifically authorized by the criminal procedure law to perform any crucial functions, right? So the critical evidence must be collected and stored in a way that my office as the DA can actually deem admissible for trial. The crime scene must be preserved in anticipation of the collection of additional evidence and analysis. As police officers, they're authorized to obtain samples for chemical analysis of a suspect's breath. They are authorized to take saliva. They are authorized to take blood. Without this evidence, people that are driving impaired by drugs and or alcohol, and they kill people and they maim people, our prosecutions are gonna be severely curtailed. Um, most notably, police officers are authorized to obtain search warrants to collect additional evidence in investigating these collision scenes, a crucial function that's, by the way, unavailable to DOT. Uh, the timing of obtaining such warrants is critical. Since January of 2020, my office has worked with CIS to expeditiously obtain two dozen court authorized search warrants to obtain evidence that may be found. It's found in the car. It's found in the black box. It's part of DNA and forensic samples. Uh, there's blood samples for chemical testing. Um, then they are all very, extremely time sensitive. And you wanna make sure that you're getting a correct analysis of all of these things at the time of the crash. And it's our duty to help prevent these crimes and to make the streets safer um, for all of us. You know, in a hit and run case, and I'll give you an example because I heard a lot of people talking about 
hit and runs. In the hit and run case this past year, CIS detectives in my office worked together. They obtained authorized search warrants for the vehicle's airbags. And the airbags helped to identify the suspect that killed a passenger in the vehicle that he hit. In another vehicle case, we were able to obtain a search warrant in the middle of the night based on information provided by a CIS detective for a driver's blood order after the driver refused to provide a breath, a breath or a blood sample to measure the blood alcohol. Though an expedient and thorough investigation at the time of this incident, working with CIS, we were able to hold the driver accountable for the criminal charges. Taking the primary responsibility of these investigations out of the hands of NYPD will undoubtedly have detrimental effects on our ability to prosecute dangerous drivers and to provide some sort of sense of justice to the victims that are left behind. Look, most of you, most of you here know how strong I believe in uh, collisions and holding people accountable. I do think that you can make the streets safer through collaboration with DOT, because I do agree with my colleague, Dave McMahon, that this is an extremely loadable, very loudable um, thing that you would like to do. And I think that it's necessary. I just think that transferring the responsibility when accountability is also so important for the future safety of drivers, pedestrians, bike riders, and everyone is crucial. So thank you for your time today. And like uh, DA McMahon, we're happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Chair, Councilmember Yeager has a question for this witness. Well, we will end it with all of them after we finish with all the DA, then we ask any questions. I, I think these are the only two DAs we have uh, testifying in person. Okay, then. So I'm sorry, then. Uh, let, let's hear from Councilmember Yeager and then I will ask a question. I, I thought that we have more DAs. That's what I said. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, I defer to you if, uh, Mr. Chair, no. I'll defer to you if you, okay. It's okay, you, you, can, you can start, and that's fine with me, yeah. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, Madam District Attorney, I, I don't doubt for a second that you read the bills. Uh, you and D.A. McMahon are, are, are legends uh, and, and uh, former legislators in this house and uh, at a time when, when uh, common sense ruled and uh, I'm very grateful for your service. And it's, it's an honor to try to even fill the shoes that you and DA McMahon left behind. Um, uh, I, I wanted, I'll start in no particular order, but since you're the last one to testify, Madam DA, um, you know, justice and accountability uh, were talked a lot about in this hearing uh, this morning and by yourself and the DA, uh, DA McMahon. And, and really in my, in my view, uh, and perhaps I'm, I'm somewhat alone in this council in thinking it, but justice and accountability are not alone served by fixing the road uh, where a crash happened. That's important work. That has to happen. That's the DOT's job. But justice and accountability for a heinous crash which took the life uh, or injured somebody or even caused property damage by a criminal perpetrator, somebody who drove unsafely and did so in a criminal way, is the function of the judicial system. It's the function of the district attorneys. It's the function of, as uh, as, as the uh, famous uh, uh, starting to a New York show goes, uh, law and order. The police who investigate the crimes and the district attorneys who prosecute the offenders. And these are their stories. And you gave us some of them today. The DOT, in my view, and this may not turn into a question, but the DOT, in my view, uh, doesn't have that expertise. But it's not just the expertise that's lacking. It doesn't have the legal tools. And we, as a council, are not empowered to give them the legal tools. And as UDA uh, Katz and uh, DA McMahon uh, uh, alluded to, the the idea that that we're going to turn this over—I don't want to call them bureaucrats—but um, in my mind, this the analogy I think would be: we don't, you know, we don't move sanitation pickup from the sanitation department to the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene just because it's healthy and mentally hygienic to have a clean city, um, or we don't go to an eye doctor for heart problems. We rely on law enforcement to not just to get the warrants, but in the immediate aftermath of a crash to sometimes do the warrantless seizure that is necessary and that's permissible under the Fourth Amendment. People who work for the DOT don't have the ability to do that. So, you know, you have both talked about this and, and uh, DA McMahon, just to prove that I'm a big nerd, I have this article that you wrote on February 12th 
uh, the op-ed in the Daily News, um, and yes, DA Katz knows me for long enough to know that I'm a little bit of a nerd. Um, I, and I, I really refer my colleagues to this to this article, to this op-ed from DA, Kat, from DA McMahon. It, it sets it forth so clearly. The letter from the district attorneys, from the five DAs to this council, sets it forth so clearly. This bill, in my view, would make our city more dangerous, would make pedestrians, riders, cyclists, car owners, car drivers, passengers, everybody who uses our roads, and by the way, our sidewalks, more vulnerable uh, uh, and ultimately uh, less safe. So I guess my question is, really, is there a way in your minds, and DA McMahon, you suggested withdrawing the bill, uh, but you are both uh, you you are both former members of this house, and I'm curious to know if you believe that this bill, there is anything in this bill that can resuscitate the bill to the point where it actually makes sense, or is this simply such a such an ill-conceived notion as I believe uh, that it simply must die? Either either of you, it's, this is uh, this. I'll, I'll just jump in quick because um, I, 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 I think that um, what could be done and should be done is really, uh, and I, I say this with all due respect, a better understanding of what it is CIS does, how it works uh, a scene, if you will, how it works a crime, if you will. Uh, and as DA Katz uh, 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 outlined uh, so well, uh, the different steps along the way that uh, that the police department has to take in order to uh, investigate a case and allow us to prosecute the case in, in terms of evidence, in terms of warrants, uh, in terms of securing the crime scene, in terms of uh, making arrests uh, uh, when appropriate, uh, in, in terms of investigating, you know, and then uh, when you think it's not just the scene, but there could have been other drivers who passed and using um, LPRs and things like that to identify other witnesses and get all the witnesses uh, statements in. All of those things happen in such a real time way in such a fast way um, that you have to understand that. Uh, certainly my, my colleague, uh, my, my assistant, uh, uh, Frank has offered to meet with anyone to because he goes to these scenes to explain to anyone who really wants to know what happens on the scene, understand that. And then secondly, to work with the police department and DOT to get the data that you really seem to be wanting to and, and have been discussing to understand how many collisions there are, how many are serious, critical, deadly, uh, how many are the result of um, criminality, how many are the result of civil negligence, and how many are the result of almost unavoidable because maybe there was uh, some sort of infrastructure uh, uh, defect that caused the accident it was almost unavoidable, and that's where DOT could come in and 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 fix that problem. But it sounds like um, again, it's a laudable goal to to prevent all accidents, uh, but this or uh, collisions, this is not the way uh, to do it. Uh, the way to do it is to work with the partners here, the PD and the DOT in particular, uh, to get the to get the facts, to get the data. Uh, and then to uh, come up with uh, solutions uh, with them in their role of uh, holding people uh, accountable and delivering justice for the police department and prevention uh, for the Department of Transportation. And also uh, maybe even mandating uh, a, a victim advocacy uh, role for victim services for uh, individuals who are uh, victims of uh, collisions, uh, but do not get that type of service. If I might add, uh, number one, Mr. Chairman, um, the DA McMahon said in the beginning, and I just want to repeat that all, all five DAs uh, wrote a letter that we submitted into evidence. So, uh, you know, the, uh, the DA and I are here, uh, but we represent, you know, we're representing the five DAs already put in their testimony. So just so you know, uh, the other three are also uh, opposed uh, to this legislation. In answer to your question, Councilman Yeager, you know, I, I am of the belief that the goals of this legislation and CIS being active and continuing to do what they do with the expertise that they have are not mutually exclusive. So in section 19-182.3C, uh, 
You have the review of street design. There's absolutely no reason, and I doubt that it doesn't happen now, although someone else would have to answer that, um, you know, that DOT goes back and looks at the crime scene of those that CIS have already investigated uh, when uh, the collision investigation is done and looks to see how we can make that particular street safer, how we can make that particular bike lane safer, how we can make uh, the signals on the street and the lights safer. I mean, DOT has to be part of that analysis on how we respond to collisions that could have been avoided. And so I do think that that part of your legislation um, is something that we could work with. I think that we're here today to say, you know, if we really want to hold drivers accountable, if we really want to make sure that victims' families have accountability when it comes to those that cause collisions that kill or maim individuals, then we need to have the experts involved in the investigation. We need to be able to do the investigation. And as the district attorney, I need to be able to be assured of the fact that when the evidence comes before me and when my folks are going into a grand jury or a trial, that the evidence gathered by the experts that were at the scene are gathered properly within the law and the necessary evidence that I need is also taken. They have to know, do I need the blood? Do I need saliva? How do you test for someone who just smoked? How do you do, figure out that they're drug impaired when uh, you know, the signals may not be that obvious? So I do think that, that one is not preclusive of the other. Um, and so look, we're here to say that the primary responsibility should be to those that allow us to hold drivers that cause death accountable. And that's, you know, just Go ahead. Mr. Chief, just one, one quick question, um, uh, DA Cass, just to follow up uh, on the on the collection of evidence. You know, some of this is is obviously blood work, uh, breathalyzer, things like that. Um, and the reality is that it's it's not this is not simply technical work. Uh, and please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm, I'm in, not in your line of work, but this is law enforcement collection of evidence. This is the, these are not things that can be done by technicians who happen to work for a city agency, but they have to be done by law enforcement for purposes of preserving the chain of evidence, for making sure that the that the people who are able to testify to what was seen uh, and what was retrieved through these tests are is actually representative of, of an indicator that a crime was committed. Is it your, do you have the view that it's possible that these tasks can somehow be outsourced to DOT in any way? or must they remain in the police department no matter pretty much what we legislate? Sorry, Council Member, before our DA answer the question, uh, after this question, we need to move to the next Council Member because of the timing that we need to move to the public. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank right, you. so there's, there's two components to that answer. Number one, yes, you have to work with the OCME and it's law enforcement that works with the OCME. You have to know exactly uh, how to take it, uh, you have to know exactly the chain of evidence, you have to know exactly uh, what is going to be admissible in a courtroom, you have to be able to testify in that courtroom, you got to be able to testify at the grand jury. So there's a lot of expertise that can only be done by law enforcement. The second part really is, you know, we, we work uh, with the police every single day. And whether they're CIS, who are investigating those cases that are likely uh, to die or critical or death, or whether they're the patrol people that are on the street who then call their sergeant to come in and control the scene because CIS may not be appropriate for that. Those individual police officers have been trained as well in working with these types of cases. So, even if it's not CIS, uh, there are several types of expertise that is needed on the ground to investigate whatever has happened in that collision that they learn in the academy and with experience and with continuing education. Thank you. Thank you, but and basically I want to be sure for whoever is listening to this conversation and, and to whoever is writing, in the way of how this unit, even if it's maintained under the NYPD of coordinating together with DOT, 
the men and women, the way how I see that we'll continue to do investigation doesn't have to change those 26 that we have right now. So, and, and of course, I'm looking to hear your expertise on this. And, and I think that, you know, uh, and I know that we all share the common goal, uh, but it has to be clear on record, right? No, in the way how I see, this is not about DOT hiring new people with expertise. In the way how I see, if there's 26 men and women right now that are being trained from the law enforcement to do investigation, and if even we need to double that number, they will be, we will not lose any of those men and women already under this collision investigation squad unit. And even if we are more, those people will have to be getting the same type of training that those 26 have received. So I feel that the piece when it comes to how, you know, and for me it's not into like, it has to be necessarily DOT completely. For me, this is about how can we expand the effectiveness and cover more people in this investigation that's all I'm looking for. And, and as I say, more than happy, I have a lot of respect for both of you because of the job that you do, and especially with the spirit that you have in both at the DA and the previous role that you also have here in, 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 in our other council. So, you know, I just want to be, bring the clarity to that piece. Thank you. So, thanks. Now let's hear from council member Holden, gonna be limiting the common question to three minutes so that we can also then move to the public, to the other members of the public. Thank you, Chair. I'll be quick. Um, and thank you both. Thank you both DAs for your work in defending and protecting public safety. Uh, and I just want to, um, I just want to ask, um, uh, you're not opposed to what the chair just said, both of you are not opposed to try to expand um, some of the work that the CIS is doing in, in some of the investigations. Let's say expand the pool, maybe change the criteria um, to investigate some of these uh, accidents or collisions? No, I, from our perspective, I, I think that that's something also uh, that uh, could be looked at uh, as has been discussed here today uh, in any collision where there's criminality, it's, if it's not investigated by CIS, then it's investigated by the the, the precinct squad uh, and uh, patrol, uh, if the, you know, and 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 uh, or a combination, uh, and I think that that's that's something that uh, they could use support. There are times that the, the it doesn't seem like it's a CIS case, and then sometimes CIS is called in to consult, even though it's not officially a, a CIS case. So the the, the uh, people power from CIS pitches in a little bit, so you could expand. Um, that, uh, the, again, that bandwidth, if you will, by uh, increasing their resources, uh, their mission or the cases that they cover. Uh, but, you know, and, and again, it's ex extremely complicated because we, we talk about all the steps that are taken uh, in any investigation. They've been spoken about here today. But if you think about the particular cases, you know, we had a a case uh, a few years ago where an off-duty police officer from New Jersey came to Staten Island and before uh, he sped in the uh, wrong direction on the West Shore Expressway, he spent hours here on Staten Island in different bars. Um, and so uh, the CIS together with the local squad had to work on collecting all the video from his actions that led up to the accident, uh, the collision itself. Again, I'm dating myself. Um, and so you had to do all the things that you would do in any crash, but also a much more expanded uh, in investigation. And so that's CIS working with the, the, the broader police department and the great work that they do. Uh, these cases are complicated. We recently had a case where a gentleman uh, in, in a domestic violence situation is accused of crashing uh, the vehicle into a tree to victimize uh, further uh, his victim. And so you have the domestic violence element mixed in together with uh, uh, the crash itself. Uh, again, extremely complicated cases that really belie this easy solution of just moving the unit into a different uh, department because you want to prevent accidents from occurring. Uh, leave the, the criminality aspect, the accountability and the justice uh, uh, with the police department and the DA's office, and also, hey, beef up DOT's avail uh, 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 resources as well uh, to 
to better achieve uh, preventing more of these cases. But no, we would not oppose that as long as their mission stays where it is and how it is. If it's broader, that's fine. Right. And, and Councilman, I think that, you know, just so I could add to that, look, C CIS investigates the most egregious uh, uh, victims um, results. And, and that's on purpose, right? They, they are meant to investigate those that result in death. They are meant to investigate those that are likely to die. They're meant to investigate those that are critical in, critically injured so that there is some justice or just some, some closure uh, for the families of those that are no longer here. Um, you know, if you wanted to add, it's, it's funny, I was listening to the police testify, I'm thinking, of course, they'll take more staff if you wanted uh, to give it and they could investigate more crimes. And in fact, CIS with the results they have or with the um, resources they have, a lot of times we'll call on them for their expertise on cases that may not come exactly within their bandwidth, but I know that they have the expertise um, to answer the questions. Um, but how many more staff members they would need if you expanded their purview? I mean, I think that's something we can talk about. All I can tell you is that when you deal with a victim's family and the victim is not able to speak, they are not able to um, be present and not able to answer any questions themselves, uh, or they die, the expertise is critical. Okay, ju just a, qu a quick uh, question. It could be yes or no, um, Chair, if, if I may. Um, <laughs> were, were any of the uh, DAs consulted on this bill um, at all? Just uh, somebody reaching out, some council member reaching out, or the city council reaching out to get your opinions before the bill um, was heard? Not, not prior to its uh, uh, introduction, uh, and, uh, but uh, we are grateful for the opportunity that our voices are being heard now in this process, but not, not previously. Okay. DA Katz? No, but again, with, you know, DA McMahon and I, I know the speed and, and, and the investigation that goes into writing uh, the bills. We appreciate uh, being able to comment today. I would ask that, um, you know, look, I would ask like the DA said as well, um, for this to either be withdrawn or tabled, uh, if there's any additional information needed on the expertise and needed on why we need to hold drivers accountable um, for, for, the, for the injuries that they cause, uh, we'd be happy to answer the questions after. I do have with me as well, John Kaczynski. Um, you can write that name down if you also need any expertise. He handles all of the deaths uh, from collisions that happen in the borough of Queens County. And again, you know, I have someone specializing in the deaths as well, because it's such a, a finite area of expertise. Uh, and he has had years yeah. in investigating these um, collisions. Thank you. Thank you. Our colleagues have that each office has an expertise, un a unit with expertise. Sure. They'd be happy that I volunteer them to meet individually with their council members or as a group. Yeah, um, they'd be happy to do it. Thank you. And, and we will follow with you. And I got to say that, yeah, the, the, the center staff of the council, they did consult it, at least getting the feedback from the Brooklyn Brooklyn DA before uh, uh, moving this, introducing this bill. Uh, it doesn't necessarily say that the Brooklyn DA give the okay or if they agree with this, but at least for the purpose of consulting, uh, we, we did that. Uh, uh, and, 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 and again, whatever place we end it, we, in my case, in my role as chairman of this committee, and the lead prime of this together with Lander Speaker Johnson, the AYPD will maintain, will maintain the investigative role in this. I think that it is important now just to continue conversation, especially with you from the DA role uh, to figure out on, on how uh, we, again, can uh, continue moving forward. Uh, but I want to move a little bit from that piece and, and ask you two questions. One is on, on uh, the cases that you've been investigating, that you've been uh, 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 prosecuting related to hit and run and crashes. And of course, I mean, cases that you can share. I don't talk about cases that is on the investigation that you can know uh, share any information because of the moment of the investigation. 
I've been, I've been involved, deeply involved in two cases. One was in the Bronx, a, a young person, recent graduate from college, a, a Mr. Rivera, that it was only even in Fox 5, the case, the image where the driver put his car in fire to get rid of all the evidence. Uh, that happened like, I think like seven, six years ago. And it took like two or three years, you know, from the bronze DA and to continue working in this case. And even with the support that they got because the family had a lawyer who worked at Columbia Law School, they were only able, I think, to get like a year and a half in jail. Even though the person, again, put the car in fire, in fire to get rid of the evidence and everything. Then we work with, I went a couple of times having a meeting with the family of DJ Paul in Brooklyn also. And I know that, you know, it took time. And, and, and it's not that I expect it. I believe that I have some understanding about, you know, all the work that you guys had to do to prove it, to make a strong case. But even in that, in that case, in the DJ poll, uh, uh, it was only like, I think like a one or two year. And I feel that as we are listening from you now, a legitimate concern, something that I hope that we will continue getting your feedback. I also see that we are at an equal situation when it comes for us going together to the state to get some changes at the state level to empower you guys, all the DA, to be able to prosecute, to have more tools when you prosecute those cases. So what can you say about, you know, changes that you expect also at the state level that we should go together and ask for? And second is, if you can share again, like in the number of cases that you uh, have in front of you last year in 2019 related to uh, uh, crashes. And how many of those were you able to uh, end up proving that those drivers were guilty? Um, so we, in, here in Staten Island, I think the, uh, we consulted with Frank who handles these cases. We don't have any major outstanding uh, hit and run or leaving the scene accidents where we didn't ultimately catch uh, the perpetrator and were able to prosecute them, uh, largely because uh, the great work that the police department does in quickly uh, gathering evidence, uh, in particular physical evidence from the scene um, and statements from possible witnesses and video uh, of evidence taken from the scene and also collations uh, from around people approaching and leaving the scene. So we don't have those. I would say, as you talk to the state, Mr. Chairman, one thing that we see is that uh, the penalty for leaving the scene of an accident is a de-nonviolent felony and uh, not one that the courts take as seriously as we would like. We would like to see more teeth in that law uh, so that we could prosecute those cases with more effect. Okay, thank you. I, I would also add, um, look, every, every case that we, uh, brought and charged with the cooperation of CIS uh, last year ended in accountability, conviction, or was still pending. Um, and it's gathering of the evidence and the time it took to make sure that we had a solid case. And by the way, that it was the right thing to do. <laughs> you know, we have to make sure that we're holding the right person accountable. And, uh, and especially if it's CWI and all these other things that come into it, that we have the elements proven as we prosecute the case. Um, I will only tell you, Mr. Chairman, I have been increasingly frustrated by those that drive, and, I, and this is a totally different subject than we're talking about, but since you asked the question, I have been increasingly frustrated by those uh, drive with a suspended license because of losing their license, not because of a financial issue, but if they lost their license because of DWIs or because they were reckless drivers, and then they're driving again, and you know, then something happens that may or may not be uh, fault. Uh, and that comes up time and time again. If you have a suspended license and it's taken because you are a dangerous driver, you shouldn't be driving. Uh, and I do find that the laws 
sometimes are a little frustrating to me. Uh, and we're happy to talk about that with you. Um, I do think DWI uh, needs to be taken, um, you know, very seriously. Uh, you know, I have taken a little bit of heat because we now hold uh, DWI drivers accountable to the fullest extent that I'm allowed to. Um, I, 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 under extremely rare circumstances, um, have we allowed a plea bargain on them? Um, and I do think they held to be, need to be held accountable. I do think it's one of the most selfish crimes uh, that you can commit. Um, and so I think that, you know, those are just some of the things. But right now, to get back to where we are, the legislation that's in front of you asks that DOT take the primary responsibility for these investigations, for the 374 investigations last year that either ended up in death, likely to die, or critical. And, you know, I just sort of wanted to bring us back to what we have in front of us which is that we do believe that the expertise of CIS is best to handle those cases to make sure that where we hold drivers accountable, that we are able to do so in a legal and uh, get a conviction. Thank you. And, and as you know, in your previous role, before being the Queens VP also, you know that a, a bill had a, always the opportunity to now go back to, you know, to City Hall and see what changes we make. So. So thank you for your input. Uh, can, can you, like, we're just looking at the 374, you know, investigated by the uh, coalition uh, investigation squad unit, but do you have any recollection or other, and of course, yes, because we have like 43 cases of crashes that ended with injury. And yes, because you are a driver and you are in a crash and so on, the injury doesn't mean that you are have committed a criminal act, but those cases should be investigated. And in pedestrians, I have two daughters and I have a car too. So it could be that God forgive I'm in a crash and so get injured and injuries. Of course, investigation should be done and if a ex person, including me, whoever is guilty of anything, there should be consequences. But if, when you look at it, those, isn't that a big concern that and as you heard from the NYPD, uh, 43,000 uh, uh, crashes happened last year that involved injuries. Uh, and have you, wh where do you see the number of those cases being in front of you? Not yet at 374. I will look towards my expertise, my experts sitting next to me while uh, DA McMahon tries an answer on that. Okay. <laughs> And of course, I, I look to uh, ADA Prospero as well. But um, again, there are many cases that don't uh, get handled by CIS uh, that we do do prosecutions on. Um, and the reckless endangerment cases, they're leaving the scene of the accident. Um, and then, you know, there's all, but then there's also many, uh, if it's, uh, civil negligence, and that initial evaluation will be done by the police officer who responds to the scene. They, When they fill out their state mandated accident report, as the state calls it, they have to make an assessment uh, whether or not there was criminality or, or not. Uh, and in the case of serious injury, I know that that gets reviewed up and, and if there is something there, then it gets referred to a detective. So what I, I think, as I said before, like a suggestion that I see instead of passing this bill, uh, is to do a deep dive on those numbers. And I'm sure the police department could provide that working with you uh, uh, and, and DOT as well, uh, and the state to evaluate those cases and see how many are um, prosecuted, uh, at, prosecuted, how many are investigated for criminality and how many are not and where along the process those decisions are made and there perhaps evaluate are there ways to change the way that those process, those decisions are made. But I don't think you can do that until you really uh, do uh, an evaluation of those. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I also, I just wanna to say too, that even in our office, in addition to giving a victim advocate to a victim, uh, there are that we enhance in our office as well uh, when we we may think that it should be looked at from a detective, detective investigators, and I have some that 
came from the hollow, uh, highway squad or CIS work in my office, and we do that as well. So there are instances where that could happen. I think you have to uh, you really dig into those numbers, Mr. Chairman, with your staff, and see how many there really are. Okay. And, and I will echo uh, DA McMahon. I'm, we're happy to help, you know, really do a deep dive into those numbers. Yeah, I, I would like to point out one thing that probably has not been pointed out yet. As much as the expertise of CIS for the likely to die or de death or um, critical is, and as much as the expertise is of the police officers, if there's injuries but not CIS qualified, remember that with all this expertise, we're also exonerating people of criminality as well, right? So it's not just about, now sometimes collisions just are not criminal and sometimes they are. And I think there has to be an acknowledgement of that um, there may be 43,000 injuries. Um, the ones that come to us that deserve uh, accountability, we are gonna hold them accountable. Um, but with the expertise of the police department, with the OCME, with all of the labs and, and, and experts that we have that are involved in each of our scenes, we also can make sure that we're not holding people criminally uh, liable that aren't. Um, and so I think that's an important balance that I just wanted to mention. Correct. Thank you. And, and of course, like we hear a lot of frustration. Uh, so to so many of you guys also, we have so many cases uh, uh, in front of you. And I feel that we both agree that, as I said before, uh, and I say frustration when it comes to, you know, many red tapes that have been in the middle in many of those cases. Like sometimes I know that in some of the cases that I've been personally involved with those families, uh, the aid has to be waiting for months to get the result of the, of the blood test uh, coming from the labs. So I, I think that, you know, it, it's more than one thing that we should look at it and happy to continue again, uh, taking your feedback and, and see how we can deal with this epidemic. When we heard 2019, there was 210,000 crashes in New York City. Last year, there were 111,000 crash, uh, crashes that in hit the road more than 44,000. One person dying every week. Like, that's too much. And I think, of course, I know you're NYPD is doing the job. You know, you are doing your job at the DA, and we have to do our part. So let's continue the conversation. Thank you for your service, both of you and the rest of the DA. Thank you. Thank you. And now we're gonna be going to the rest of the public. We're gonna be leaving in the time to two minutes. And it, please, if anyone will be taking longer, yes, summarize when you are close to the two minutes and the, if your testimony take longer, yes, send it to, to the council. Thank you, Chair. Uh, our next panelist will be Bernadette Karna. Bernadette. Time begins now. Go ahead, Bernadette. I'm here. Go ahead. Can you can you hear me? Yes, we, hear we do. And 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 before I also want to clarify. Sorry, uh, I want to put on record to clarify that as I say that the that the is is central staff of the council and get feedback from the Brooklyn DA that they were not consulted before the bill was drafted. That consultation was made, trying to share some feedback, but it was after the bill was drafted. I have worked very close and have a lot of respect for our uh, Brooklyn DA Gonzalez. So uh, I wanted to, you know, clarify that. Thank you. You may begin now. Oh, I'm sorry, you're waiting for me. Um, th thank you, thank you, uh, Chair, and thank you, um, everybody. My name is Bernadette Karna. I am a member of Families for Safe Streets and a survivor of a hit and run crash. On June 8, 2016, I was run over by a reckless driver while in the crosswalk with the light. The driver dragged me 50 feet and then fled, leaving me for dead. My ribs were crushed and I had numerous other fractures to my back, shoulder, knee, and foot. 
While I was recovering, I relied on the police to do, to do a complete investigation. However, my case wasn't investigated thoroughly. The precinct detective assigned to my case went on a two week vacation during the critical investigative period and closed my case after four months. No charges were filed and he retired shortly thereafter without any further investigation. I was told very little and the video of the crash was lost by the NYPD. I waited over 19 months to receive the first detailed report of the crash. From the report, I learned that city cameras captured a car and play, prompting the detective to question a person of interest. It was only after the New York Times profiled my crash and I shared my story with the city council that the NYPD collision investigation squad reopened my case in September of 2018, more than two years after my crash. With the CIS review reviewing the case, I was hopeful that the driver would be found and held accountable. To my surprise, the video of the crash was found, and it was only then that the NYPD identified the correct SUV that ran over me. The owner of the vehicle was located, and she admitted ownership. Uh, and an hour after my hit and run, the SUV was set on fire in Brooklyn. Her daughter insured the vehicle and never spoke to the police. She didn't respond to police phone calls or a house call. I was shocked to learn that she could ignore the detective and the police search ended there. Despite new information from a second investigation, I was utterly dismayed in June of 2019 when the NYPD closed the investigation without pressing any charges. Whether it is a lack of resources to investigate and prosecute drivers or an apathy that these are just accidents is unclear. But what is obvious is that the justice system doesn't bring justice to crash victims or hold reckless drivers accountable. To prevent these crashes and lack of justice from happening to others, I strongly support changes to the CIS and increased involvement of the Department of Transportation. The DOT is committed to Vision Zero. They have the expertise to conduct a detailed analysis at every crash site to understand what could have prevented the crash. This analysis will help address the underlying issues and truly make our streets safe. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions from council members for this witness? Okay, seeing none, our next panelist will be Dulce Canton. Dulce? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Dulce Canton and I'm a member of Families for Safe Streets and survived a hit and run crash on August 7th, 2014. I was biking home and my friend Jay was skateboarding. We waited patiently at the light at Bleeker and Wilson. I was wearing all of the cycling gear meant to keep us safe a helmet, light colored clothing, front and rear light, and a bell. It was important to me as a black woman and a cyclist to be the perfect role model. When the light turned green and I started to follow Jay through the intersection, I heard a car engine rumble and then boom, a Chevy Camaro crashes into the rear of my bike and my person. I remember flying up into the air and landing in the street on my right shoulder like a human rag doll. My very first thoughts were, am I going to die? Is this the end? Will my family have to plan and attend my funeral? Where is my bike and is she okay? Thank goodness I can feel my hands and toes. I know my name, I'm conscious. I think back now about the excruciating physical pain I was in and my fears knowing that NYPD doesn't have a good track record of working with black and communities of color. As a black woman, I have firsthand personal experience. My mother survived the hit and run crash in the Bronx in the 2000s and the police NYPD was of no help. When I was in the hospital, I called a coworker and he referred me to Steve Vaccaro, lawyer. He said, he will take care of you. He got to working on my case immediately, traveling, traveling back to the crash site and completing an investigation with my friend Jay that the NYPD failed to do. He gathered witness statements, obtained not one, but two CCTV videos of the crash from a nearby building superintendent and was giving a right side dri driver mirror to the Camaro from one of the witnesses. Being injured in a crash is very traumatic. I was unable to work for weeks, was in pain from the concussion and a broken ankle and terrified to get on my bike. I had to set up a GoFundMe to pay my rent and for food. I knew I wanted to bike again once my body recovered but that I would also need talk therapy to get over the PTSD. 
It was all so much to go through at the time. And I'm very thankful for everyone who helped me. But sadly, the NYPD was of absolutely no help. I expected to at least get a call from the detective. No call. About three weeks later, my head was feeling a bit better. So I called the 83rd precinct myself, only to be told that the detective assigned by case went on vacation. We had the incident on tape, a witness corroborated my story and the car had been traced to its owner. The NYPD told me they would question the driver if they had the time. Gothamist even profiled the NYPD's failure to apprehend the driver, but even after the article, NYPD never took action. Although a civil court found him responsible, he is still allowed to drive his car and was never forced to change his dangerous behavior. Clearly the NYPD is failing, which is why I'm here today to support changes to CIS and increased involvement of DLT. But on behalf of Families for Safe Streets, we urge the council to go even further to reduce the role of the NYPD officers play in traffic enforcement. As indicated in our statement supporting the fight for racial justice. It is essential that ending the preventable and epidemic of traffic violence does not inadvertently harm people of color. First, we urge the council to support our call for a pilot program for failure to yield, block the box, bike lane and distracted driving cameras, which the council can do without any authorization from Albany. Automated enforcement does not racially profile and is proven to change behavior with only modest fines. Second, we urge the council to consider moving routine traffic enforcement to the DOT as well. There is no to have armed officers enforcing our traffic laws. That's not how we will achieve Vision Zero. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And, and thank you. As you know, working always committed to continue working close with you, uh, the members and leadership of the Family for Safe Street and Transportation Artillery, all the advocates. Uh, please, if your testimony will take more than two minutes, a yes summarize and send in the written testimony to the council. Thank you. Okay, our next panelist will be Amy Tam Liao. Amy. Hi. On October 6, 2013, we got an awful phone call telling us to go to the hospital because our daughter Allie was hurt. It wasn't until we got to the hospital that our ER doctor uh, told me that Allie and her grandmother had been hit by a car. Allie died that day. She was three years old. Grandma lived, but is not the same. I am Allison Hopelau's mom. My name is Amy. At the hospital, the police officers told my husband that there was nothing they could do and provided excuses for the driver. The driver didn't see Allie and grandma. The driver had a blind spot. They actually took the time to ex um, provide extensive detail and what part of the car can cause this blind spot and never mention that Allison and her grandma had the signal and the light of, and the right of way. It was as though they had already made up their mind before the investigation was complete. Our nightmare was compounded when the newspapers read that Allie had broken free from grandma's hand and that she was walking behind grandma. NYPD was cited as the source. The next day, the owner of a dash camera submitted a video to the po police of the crash Allie and grandma were hand in hand. I'm sorry, and uh, take your time. Okay. A distracted driver of, a, of an SUV made a, um, an aggressive left turn, failed to yield and hit them both. Knocked Allie to the ground and rolled over her with both the front and rear tires. The video is available for anyone to see. Okay, to prevent these crashes, the rest of my testimony has been submitted. Um, I'm just gonna skip to this part. To prevent these crashes and lack of justice from happening to others, I strongly support changes to CIS and increased involvement from the DOT. The DOT has been leading the fight for Vision Zero, does not have the same pro-driver biases as the NYPD, and has the expertise to conduct a detailed systemic analysis at every crash to make our streets safer. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, our next panelist will be Marco Connor Diacqua. Marco. I begins. 
Yes, thank you, Chair Rodriguez, and thank you for spearheading this, this bill and hearing. I represent Transportation Alternatives. As Deputy Director, we are the city's uh, nonprofit advocacy organization for livable and safe streets. We strongly support Intro 2224. New Yorkers need an overhaul of the current crash investigation process. It is abundantly clear that the status quo is not working for anyone, that the NYPD and DAs we heard from today want to maintain the status quo. And I want to address the missing information that they provided. Uh, most importantly, I urge everyone to not believe the spin put forth by the city agencies today and the DA saying that enforcement and prosecution of the worst reckless driving will somehow be taken away with this bill and that the highly trained CIS officers somehow won't be doing crash investigations anymore and that confidential private data will somehow be made publicly available for all to see. That is not true. It is spin and fear mongering and it is disinformation that I pray that the council and reporters do not buy into. Um, into 2224 would still allow for prosecution when appropriate in compliance with state law. Um, and to address DOT's four person office of emergency response that responds to CIS crashes, if the post crash assessments of that DOT unit were heeded by this administration, we would have, we would have achieved vision zero already. Um, it should not have taken decades of advocacy and hundreds of deaths to convert the Queens Boulevard of death. How our city provides crash information to reporters informs the changes that the public demands, and into 2224 would help address that. Now, we just heard, heard the most gut wrenching accounts from crash victims and survivors providing a damning condemnation of the NYPD's and DA's current crash response. Um, and uh, those are just the tip of the iceberg. NYPD routinely engages in harmful victim blaming and premature statements to media. It's clear that NYPD is either unwilling or unable to adequately address victim blaming. In addition, they fail to investigate crashes. They fail to investigate thousands of hit and run crashes that result in injuries. Um, a recent TA report uh, documents this. An eight year old child was tragically killed just this very morning in Brooklyn in a hit and run. Um, in addition to inadequate investigations of hit and runs, since at least 2015, NYPD has likely been in violation of state law that requires them to adequately investigate thousands of failure yield crashes under the right of way law. And importantly, the current criteria determining CIS crash response allows for complete discretion by the NYPD to respond to any crash they want to, not just the crashes that they are presented, um, NYPD could unilaterally expand the cases CIS responds to right now. Um, CIS is re recognized as perhaps the best crash investigation unit in the country. The problem is that their leadership clearly does not believe that their work is worthy of expanding. Commissioner O'Neill said thanks, but no thanks to additional funding for CIS um, in 2019. Um, in closing, we recommend one, expanding crash investigation and response to include NYPD, including CIS officers, DOT, and the Department of Health. Two, create a pathway for quick implementation of street redesigns following a crash. Three, include a victim advocate from the Department of Health to provide a social worker on site to immediately support the crash victim and loved ones in navigating the confusing and often heartless process of hospital, legal insurance, and law enforcement interaction that would follow any serious crash. And finally, we suggest removing NYPD from the tens of thousands of property only and minor injury crashes. There is no need for armed police officers to respond to these crashes. Um, so in the words of Councilmember Rodriguez, intro 2224 is about coordination. It's about centering victim needs, comprehensively addressing the root causes. We strongly support intro 2224 and urge its enactment as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Marco. Um, our next panelist will be Steve Vaccaro. Steve? Yes, thank you uh, to the committee. And um, listening to this testimony today, I feel like I and the clients who I represent as an attorney representing crash victims and the families of fatal crash victims, I feel like we're, we're living in two different alternative realities. I cannot believe the representations that I heard from uh, Ms. Royster at NYPD of the, uh, 
you know, regarding the collision investigation squad that they give out resources to crash victims. All of the crash victims you've heard from today were represented by our law firm. And you will hear from two more. And none of them will tell you that they received some list of resources or frequently asked questions. And you see them nodding their heads there. And if, the, and if you can be told lies by the police department uh, officials who are giving you statements in this hearing, then you can bet that there's a lot more lies that they're telling. They do not give resources to crash victims, and they do not give the consideration to these cases that they deserve. And that is why we need the DOT involved. I was told because of technical limitations, I would not be able to actually publish this video to you. But I'm going to show you, this is Mario Valenzuela, 14 year old riding his bicycle on Borden Avenue in Queens. There is a truck that is over the double yellow to the left. He is behind the truck. And this is the video that NYPD says proves that Mario was completely at fault. He was not at fault. The truck driver makes an unsignaled left turn into Mario and kills him right there. And in the NYPD collision investigation squad report that was done by a veteran investigator that I've dealt with many times, a Detective Conlin, and signed off on by Sergeant Denig, who was at this hearing and maybe still is, they made no mention of the fact that the truck was over the double yellow to the left before suddenly cutting to the right. They made no mention of the fact in their conclusions that the truck had a broken turn signal and could not have visibly signaled to the cyclist. They make absolutely no mention of all of the facts that they gathered and did a good job of gathering and put in their file. They reached the conclusion and blamed the victim. And you will find the exact same story with Robin Heitman, a 20 year old cyclist whose mother will be testifying, who was sandwiched between a truck that merged into her from the left and a taxi that pulled out from the curb on the right and sandwiched her and killed her. And there is absolutely no mention in the NYPD's conclusions that she was blameless in this. She was blamed 100% for that collision. The evidence is there in the file, but NYPD does not understand that cyclists have a right to be on the road and the collision investigation squad has repeatedly cranked out decisions that blame the cyclists, no matter how blameless they were. I strongly encourage this bill to get the DOT involved with the NYPD so that they will understand the traffic laws with all of their wonderful specialized training and actually apply them. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Um, our, our next panelist will be Kimberly Goldfield. Kimberly. Hello, and thank you to the council for giving me the opportunity to speak today in support of this bill. My name is Kimberly Goldfeld. I am the mother of Robin Heitman, who at age 20 was killed by a box truck while they were working as a bike messenger. Anticipating a right turn as part of their job, Robin was traveling in the right-hand lane of 6th Avenue between the intersections with West 23rd and West 24th Streets. As Robin was traveling in the right-hand lane, a box truck began to change lanes into Robin's path of travel. At the same time, a taxi cab was attempting to pull off the curb into traffic. As a result, at 9.24 a.m. on June 24, 2019, Robin was run over by the box truck and killed. Many people were on the street that morning, including several eyewitnesses who saw the truck run Robin over, bouncing high as it did. However, the truck did not stop, nor did the taxi cab. They continued on only to be pulled over a few blocks later by a pedestrian who flagged them down, telling them they needed to return to the scene. Detective Center with the NYPD CIS was assigned to Robin's case. Despite his professional manner and his seeming willingness to help determine the cause of Robin's death, he ignored critical information, which caused his report to place the blame squarely on Robin. And I quote, after reviewing all available information, the cause of this collision is, in all capitals, bicyclist error. The contributing factors to this collision are the bicyclist's improper lane use and possible reaction to an uninvolved vehicle, unquote. Detective Center's report contains information that should not have been ignored to include the fact that the driver of the taxi cab did not look when he pulled out. 
The operator of the box truck was cited on scene for several equipment violations, but was not offered an interpreter and his cooperation was minimal. Both the operator of the box truck and the truck itself were allowed to leave the scene. As a result of the detective center's finding that Robin was at fault, the DMV has decided not to hold a fatality hearing. This decision is currently being appealed as the driver of the box truck needs to be held accountable for the fact that he ran Robin over, left the scene, and then stated he never knew he had run someone over. Physical evidence has shown that there were no defects in Sixth Avenue that would have caused the truck to bounce as it did. There is no reason the operator could have not have known he ran someone over. Robin's autopsy clearly showed that the truck ran them over. My understanding is that CIS is charged with determining whether a crime has been committed in cases such as these. Instead, responsibility needs to be determined and fully shouldered with appropriate consequences to include education of the driver involved and changes to the infrastructure. There are far too many vehicles on the street and not enough room for pedestrians and cyclists. What little infrastructure is available to cyclists in the form of bike lanes is often not usable due to vehicles and vendors using it as a parking lane. There needs to be protected bike lanes on every street. There needs to be fewer vehicles on the road. As a result of the negligence of the driver of the box truck and his poor driving skills, Robin Heitman lost their life. The driver of the box truck was not held accountable for his actions. The incident could have been prevented had the driver received proper driving education. The crash could have also been prevented with the presence of better infrastructure and fewer vehicles on the road. Instead, NYPD CIS stated it was Robin's fault and closed the case. In conclusion, please note the background I'm using today. This is a bandana I received during Robin's memorial ride on June 27, 2019. It hangs on my wall along with the keys to Robin's bike lock that I placed on their ghost bike. This bandana should not exist, but it does because of the irresponsible actions of the driver of the box truck. This mother should not have had to write her daughter's obituary, but she did because there are far too many vehicles on the streets and not enough responsibility being assumed by the drivers of those vehicles. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Um, our next panelist will be Martha Valenzuela. And if we could just try and keep things close to two minutes, please. Thank you. Ryan begins. Uh -huh. Okay. <clears throat> Chairman Rodriguez and members of the City Council Transportation Committee. My name is Marta Valenzuela. Thank you for the opportunity to speak about my beloved son, Mario Valenzuela, who was killed by a relic truck driver on September 21st, 2019, and the terrible injustice for the police investigation that blamed him for his own death. He was in fact not a fault. The second injustice could be had be prevented by the bill intro 2224, which I ask you to enact into law. My beautiful son, my, my beautiful 14 year old son, Mario was, out with his friends riding bicycles when he was killed. Mario loved to ride his bike and he knew how to keep safe in traffic. Even to this day, it's too painful for me to watch the video showing the truck, the truck driver killing Mario. But you have heard from my attorney, Steve Caro, who has also registered for this hearing to show you the video and to explain how the NYPD coalition investigation squad completely misunderstood the crash and unfairly blamed Mario. It was too terrible to lose my son in a traffic crash. He went out with his friends on that Saturday and he never came home. I never had the chance to protect Mario from, from that truck driver. I never had the chance to say goodbye to Mario. For a mother, these are terrible things that make my heart ache. We parents put so much of ourselves into raising a child to become an adult. The horror of having Mario suddenly ripped from our family 
by aggressive truck driver is unspeakable. Because of that unfair and incorrect decision of the police to blame Mario for his own death, this is something I must relieve and relieve over and over again. Whenever anyone asks me about Mario, I must also explain the injustice of the police in falsely blaming him. It is impossible for me to have peace, to have closure for his terrible loss. When the official government account of what happened is a lie, we look to our government to provide justice for the people at a moment like this. And instead the police department has dropped a second grand injustice on me and my family, in addition to us losing Mario. Nothing can be done to bring Mario back. We can only continue our fight to win justice for Mario's in death. But bringing to light the truth of what happened, I'm not a mind reader, and I cannot say why police choose to blame Mario when the video shows that it is not his fault. Part of it is that people, including the police, do not understand and respect the right of people, including children, to bicycle in the road. But regardless of the motivation of the police, it is clear that even the trained police specialists do not understand basic matters of the traffic law and the right of people to bicycle in the street. Please pass this bill in 2224 and move the work of investigating traffic crashes through properly trained professionals and other agencies who will fairly evaluate the evidence in cases like Mario's. In this way, you, the city council, can give some tiny measure of justice and solace to the family parents like me, who lose their children to traffic violence in you in New York City. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Um, our next panelist will be Mark Henry. Mark. Thank you, uh, Chairman Rodriguez, for this point, this uh, opportunity to speak on behalf of the ATU. Uh, the ATU appreciates this opportunity to provide commentary on Intro 224, uh, which calls for establishing a crash investigation analysis unit uh, within the city's DOT. This uh, is a clear duplication and manipulation of services, often legislation and transportation and transit spheres get developed without little or any discussion from labor or the agencies that are impacted uh, by this intro. Uh, we have shared in previous uh, comments with this committee and other committees about how the ATU is without a contract currently. And this intro seeks to corral or control the narrative on accidents and is not designed to present true unbiased opinion of facts. The, the council, by introducing this legislation, kind of reflects the same thing that I deal with with the MTA uh, involved in, on a day-to-day -day basis uh, and only provides a slant uh, on motor vehicle operators. And, and the city has many motor vehicle operators, not only in police, fire, sanitation, taxis, public bus transit, school buses, et cetera. Uh, currently, we know the NYPD handles all accident investigations and should continue to do so, uh, stripping them uh, of their duties and they're highly trained and certified in the function of evaluating accidents lacks merit and, and just demonstrates uh, a, a fiscal lack of fiscal sense. Given the unquestionable authority to a new investigative unit would be that would be embedded in the DLT, it to me just seems like a, a waste of resources and it's time consuming. It's just another attempt to litigate instead of educating the masses. Uh, Vision Zero, which was a legislation that was passed recently, uh, was globally flawed as well. It was well intended, but it was globally flawed. Uh, those civil servants were arrested at accident scenes and it demonstrates the misguided thinking, which is evident and also in this intro. Um, in short, there is no check and balance with this legislation. Uh, this piece of legislation is uh, introduced under the guise of public safety, uh, and we oppose it uh, in its entirety. Uh, uh, the ATU extends our condolences 
on the losses of those families that have been impacted at this level, but this legislation just doesn't provide the true accountability that they're looking for or a true result. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, Mark. Uh, our next panelist will be Christine Berthay. Christine? Be yes. Yes, thank you. Um, I represent here CheckPeds, which is a pedestrian safety advocacy in New York City for the last 15 years. And I think what's missing in this whole discussion is uh, the concept of trust. It is clear that NYPD is the epitome of the car culture. Their behavior and comments prove uh, generate victim blaming is prevalent. And uh, the police uses car to run into uh, you know, demonstration um, it, it, and, and they absolutely do not like cyclists. So there is a tremendous bias in the NYPD and what you are hearing here is the two side, the official side, and then the people which are going through it. And it is very, very concerning. Um, the second part is that the numbers, we need, we need different numbers. I mean, you know, it's, uh, they, they are resolving 17 cases per year per person. How does that compare to the workload of standard detective? They have a rate of 25% of conviction. I mean, is it the right number? How does that compare to normal detective? And how many of the 374 locations were fixed by the DOT? Um, and finally, communication. We, I very often uh, talk to the uh, precinct, I am on the community board, and what I hear from the agents concerning victims is horrifying. The, the comments are callous, the comments are about they don't care about the, the, the pedestrian and the people killed, and they always find an excuse to make the car driver the person who is blameless that communication. So I think we have a much bigger problem, which is how do we fix this mentality and whether uh, I believe that moving the unit to the, to the DOT would help, but this goes way deep and we have a lot of work. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Our next panelist will be Lauren Secular. Lauren. Uh, begins. Thank you for letting me testify this afternoon on this important intro 2224. My name is Lauren Secular and I work with the AMA Local District 34. I am in support of this intro. A fresh start and new ideas can help along with sharing the findings as a key component. A new set of eyes, a new perspective might be what's needed. I feel DOT may be better to complete the job with policy and procedure. As long as there are policies and programs like education, enforcement, and engineering in place that get followed. It would be nice to see current data utilized to make our roads starting safer, starting with planning commissions, safety improving infrastructures. We all benefit when we have more data, which we cannot seem to get. I have no issues where it lies, it's in the tools that are given is the key. Policy, what constitutes an investigation needs to be clear. I remain unclear as to the preparedness of DOT to vamp up the 26 folks that NYPD had. We need to be have this on the books for the incoming administration. I realize DOT has to split its resources by conducting investigations and developing new proposals for safer roads based on the information gathered from a crash scene. Currently, the squad has never shown up as a factor in policy making. CIS brass do not testify at city council hearings on traffic safety. In my opinion, the squad's work informs little and deters nothing. I've dedicated my time to micromobility and safety. Law enforcement is only one end point for these investigations. We all ride it for different reasons as well. Fun, adventure, to bond with friends, to relax, as a moving meditation, to make the commute more interesting, but to get through traffic easier, to accomplish goals. The reasons are as infinite as they are diverse. Thank you for allowing me to be heard. Thank you, Lauren, for your testimony. Uh, our next panelist will be Tanya Cruz. Tanya. I begins. Good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez, Council Member Mil Miller, Transportation Committee, and DA Katz. Thank you, Chair Rodriguez, for sponsoring intro 
2224 and listening to my testimony. I'd like to speak to the personal impact that today's policies and procedures has had and forever changed my life with one incident. While crossing the street, my father was struck by a Winnebago being driven by a 70 plus year old male, more concerned about on, an oncoming car potentially running his stop sign. This was the investigating officer's report verbally given to me and my grieving mother. More than a decade, more than decades later, we have an opportunity to broaden the scope and the bandwidth, increase manpower, and establish reporting transparency of investigations. Isn't that the driving goal? Do we say criminality and justice is not only the core, but the only driving goal, leaving the door open for downplaying additional resources outside of the NYPD and DOT toolbox? I am concerned we are missing the opportunity to concurrently work while maintaining law, order, and transportation safety goals, thus delivering safe travels while enjoying all means of transportation New York City has granted to all. We can't bring my father back. However, New York City Council, NYPD, New York City DOT, and the DA office has a chance to improve, secure additional resources, and increase entities to better assist our mayor's directives. I thank DOT for all their assistance and guidance for many, many years. To DA Katz for your encouragement and leadership. And I look forward to working with Chief Royster. The 105th and Southeast Queens Corridors need your TLC. Councilman Miller, you always have our back. Giving my best and always here to assist. Our lives are in your hands. Thank you for your testimony, Tanya. Um, our next panelist will be Glenn Belovsky. Glenn? Begins now. Looks like we're having trouble hearing Glenn. Okay, we'll go to the next person and then we can circle back to Glenn. Um, our next panelist will be Jesse Erlbaum. Jesse? Hey, uh, you can hear me, okay. Um, yes. Thank you very much, uh, Chair Rodriguez, uh, for bringing this issue up. Uh, my name is Jesse Erlbaum. I'm a New York City motorcycle rider. I'm also one of the founding members of the New York Motorcycle and Scooter Task Force, an organization started over a decade ago by New York City riders with the purpose of making motorcycle riding in New York City safer. As of today, we have nearly 3,000 members in our group, ranging from social riders for whom riding is a fun group activity, to sport riders who hone their skills on closed circuits, uh, to daily motorcycle commuters, such as myself, who choose motorcycles as an energy and cost efficient way to get to work. Our organization strongly supports this bill, as I do personally as a lifelong New Yorker. New York City motorcycles have a death problem and a data problem. Since 2010, New York City has managed to lower railroad fatalities about 15% overall. That's great, but it hides our deaths, that of motorcyclists. Motorcycle fa overall fatalities went down, but deaths of motorcycle riders during that same period went up 13%. I'd like to know why. But I cannot know the answer to this question without data, and this data is inaccessible to me. It is inaccessible to me because it is locked up behind NYPD's tradition of secrecy and distrust in the public. At this moment, I have an open FOIL request for crash data from CIS. It was filed in early October 2020 and has yet to receive any more than the automated reply that it has been received. The fact that I have to file a FOIL request in the first place is a huge barrier to accessing this information for the public good. In all likelihood, I will eventually have to sue my own city if I want to see this important information. But the most maddening part of my situation is that the report my organization is trying to create from the CIS data is for the benefit of DOT and NYPD. My org is one of a number of New York City motorcycle orgs, which have been working for two years with NYPD and DOT 
as part of Vision Zero. We've been called in to help the city reduce the rate of death of New York City motorcycle riders. It is outrageous to me that I am stymied from doing this job because of NYPD intransigence and their default stance of secrecy. This stance might serve the task of law enforcement well, but it is a huge disservice in the larger and more urgent task of public safety and health on our roads. This is why we strongly support creating a new agency to take over this critical task. The Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, the OCME, is proof that a highly technical investigations can be conducted effectively outside of the NYPD at large scale. They handle about 8,500 investigations a year, not 300 something, and still serve the public interest. Thank you very much to the chair and everybody for having this issue come up. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jesse, for your testimony. Um, next, we will go back to Glenn Belofsky, if we have his audio now. Sir, we still don't hear you. Glenn, I'm sorry, it, it seems like your audio is not working. If you could just submit your written testimony, if you're not able to speak with us. Thanks. Right, Chair Rodriguez, I think we've reached the end of our public testimony. Thank you, Elliot, for the great job that you have done. It. And also thank you to every member of the central staff of the council, as also from my end, Thank you to my chief staff, Elizabeth Conformer, to my lady director, Evelyn Collado, and to my communication person, Tomas Garita, for working with me in this. And thank you to the lead, the co-prime of this bill, Speaker Johnson and Council Member Lander. I think that there's no doubt that after listening from the chief of transportation at the NYPD, the deputy commissioner, and uh, uh, Margaret Fujoni and the DAs, uh, but most important, the, the members of the family that as everyone know, uh, if there's one way or how anyone can change the way or how we understand uh, crashes, uh, people dying, this epidemic is by listening to those family that unfortunately we cannot bring the loved one back but they fighting for justice in their name so that no other family go through the similar situation. Now, these couple of months, we hope that with the vaccine, with people maintaining distance, we using masks, we will control COVID-19. And hopefully 21, the 2021 will be our year. However, this epidemic, when we hear about 111,000 crashes, when we hear 44,000 hit and run, Thousands of people sending critical conditions to the hospital, a person dying average every week. That's the epidemic. That unfortunately, we can uh, uh, guarantee that we will close. So thank you, everyone. Thank you for the great, great job. And thank you to the sergeant also and everyone behind those computers helping us to connect. With